Yes. Great. Well, Matthew, thank you for uh, inviting me here uh, and pretty much giving me my choice of topic. And I'll start by introducing myself just very briefly for those who are just joining and then say a little bit about how those research interests intersect with the fact that I thought, yeah, this might be worth recording and sharing. So uh, my name is James McGrath, and uh, I did my uh, doctoral work at the University of Durham with uh, somebody who I understand uh, you just heard mention of and have been reading, um, Jimmy Dunn, uh, James D.G. Dunn, uh, who just passed away just recently, and uh, worked with him on the Gospel of John and uh, on the Christology of John's Gospel. And that was really the field that I started out in. From there, I've ranged across a wide array of interests. I do stuff on the intersection of religion and science fiction. If you bring up Doctor Who or something like that, you could completely get me off on a tangent. Uh, so I'm saying that not to encourage you to do that, but to suggest that uh, if you want me to stay focused, it might be best not to do that. Um, if you do indicate interest, like towards the end, I promise that I will happily make a, another appearance in an authentic fourth doctor scarf that my wife fit for me, um, should there be any interest in that. But ranging through an array of topics, uh, teaching at Butler University, which is a, uh, essentially a predominantly undergraduate liberal arts focused sort of institution with a smallish religion program. So I was immediately prompted to teach outside of my immediate areas of expertise and sometimes way outside my areas of expertise. And I've always tried to turn those things into research areas. And so one course that I developed is actually a course on uh, extra canonical early Christian literature and Gnosticism. I call it heresy because be honest, if you saw extra canonical early Christian literature and Gnosticism, you'd have to be a very specific kind of person with particular kinds of interests to even take a closer look at that. Uh, it might rope you right in. But heresy is a slightly more tantalizing name. Um, in case you're wondering, the, one of the things we do on the first day of class is problematize the notion of heresy. But in putting together readings for that class, I was reminded of the Mandaeans. And if you work on the Gospel of John uh, in any kind of depth or detail, you actually will come across them because in the middle of the 20th century, uh, first, first half to middle of the 20th century, there was a, a very popular school of thought that considered the Mandaeans to quite possibly be the background to the Gospel of John. In short, the hypothesis was that these are the descendants of the followers of John the Baptist, and you plug their literature and their ideas in as the background to the Gospel of John. John is reacting against that, and there you go. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann was a major proponent, proponent of that view. The pendulum swung away from that, and people lost interest in the Mandaeans because, like, well, if they can't explain the New Testament, then we're going to focus our attention elsewhere. But the Mandaeans are actually a really fascinating group, and they do have a connection with John the Baptist, and that's why I mentioned them. And they are essentially the last surviving Gnostic group that made it down from ancient times to the present day. Right. So there are Gnostics of all sorts. There are like neo-Gnostic churches, you know, pop-up groups. Um, interesting things generally tend to be sort of eclectic use of texts. Some of these texts have been discovered at places like Nag Hammadi in Egypt, the so-called Gnostic Gospels. But the Mandaeans are a living tradition, right? And so that makes them particularly interesting. You can actually get on YouTube. I might actually share a screen at some point. But any of you can just go on YouTube and in case you're wondering, I don't mind if your eyes are not fixed on the screen. Uh, with Zoom, it's always hard to tell. You know, you might just have the, you know, in order to make eye contact with you, I need to be looking away from the camera. And so it's, you know, if you're multitasking, I won't know. But if you're really curious about something that I mentioned, you know, feel free to you know, pull up a, a browser and look it up. But you can see Mandaean baptisms on YouTube, right? It used to be you had to go to Iraq or Iran to see this sort of thing. And so I was reminded of them as I was putting together readings and discovered that their two most important sacred texts had never been translated into English in their entirety. 
And so to make a long story short, I got involved with uh, a linguist, a Semitic philologist who did his doctoral research on a modern spoken dialect of their language, right? Because there are pockets of that still spoken in places. And we worked on translating one of these texts so is the most central one that focuses a lot on their ritual as well as some of their mythology, but on one that's known as the, the Book of John. And that is not the Gospel of John. It's not like their version of the Gospel of John or something like that. That is the Book of John as in John the Baptist. And John the Baptist does play a central role in their literature. Uh, he doesn't play a central role in their religion, right? They don't view him as their founder. They view him as an example of their tradition. And so my current research project, which is why I said, ooh, if I can talk about, the, um, about John the Baptist in this class uh, with your students, that would be my topic of choice. Uh, so I'm actually in the very early stages of working on a book on John the Baptist. And my aim is going to be to bring Mandayan sources into the picture. And one of the big reasons why people moved away from interest in the Mandayans and their literature is the fact that they were used, those sources were used somewhat uncritically, right? So the actual manuscripts are really late and the texts themselves are, are certainly not older in their present form than uh, say the, the Coptic Gnostic sources that were found in Egypt. Uh, some of them are clearly from the Islamic era in terms of their final redaction. I mean, they mentioned Muhammad uh, not favorably, just like they don't mention Jesus favorably. They're really interesting texts in that regard. Uh, but there are texts in their um, body of work, their body of literature, that don't have any Arabic loan words, right? Which is pretty much unheard of among you know, Aramaic speaking groups in the Middle East when the literature comes into existence well after the rise of Islam. And so this is a group that has continued to exist, has continued to write, has continued to edit their material. But if you bring them into the picture when looking at John the Baptist, they raise interesting possibilities. And so this will be an effort to use those sources critically, right? Not to just plug them in and say, okay, let's see what they say, and that's the story of John the Baptist. But all those critical things, those careful things, those let what the sense is for this one particular detail, Let's take a look at that other one and, oh, I think we might have a winner there, but not here as far as likelihood of historicity is concerned, uh, treating them with that same kind of caution. But even if you were to conclude that the Mandayan sources really don't tell you anything directly of value as far as the history is concerned and history of John the Baptist, just the things that they do differently raise some interesting questions. Right. And so that's why I'm interested in bringing them into the picture. So uh, one of the things that I have you know, on my outline of things that we ought to talk about are the sources of knowledge about John the Baptist. And in addition to the Mandayan sources, we also have uh, some later, we have uh, Christian sources, including some in the New Testament, but also some later sources that mention ongoing groups of followers of John the Baptist. And then we also have Josephus, right, Flavius Josephus, gives him a mention. And each of those sources comes with you know, some interesting questions about accuracy and you know, what, kinds of, what kinds of things do we need to really think hard about as we use them. But maybe I should back up for a moment and say, you know, having showed up here in a class that's focused on Jesus and immediately start talking about John the Baptist, maybe I should stop and say, why am I talking about John the Baptist in a class about Jesus? Um, and so if I ask that question, what kind of answers just very quickly might some of you give to me? Maybe the, uh, the difference between their ministries and what they represented as far as who uh, the Messiah may be. Okay, so there's, there's actually two really interesting things there. One is, this is another figure, same time period, Jewish context. Even without talking about the connection between them, just comparing and contrasting them could potentially have some interesting things. And then you mentioned who's the Messiah. Uh, there certainly are Christian sources that suggest that John's followers thought he might be the Messiah, 
and so there's some interesting there's some interesting stuff there possibly as well yeah thank you wasn't jesus a disciple of the baptist yes and i came in not knowing this group and so not knowing whether that'd be like sure so you know jesus was john's student so of course you want to look at john or wait a minute jesus learned he wasn't like all knowing and he had like a teacher and all this kind of, you know for some people it's like oh and for some people it's like yeah okay yeah next next topic uh, but yes, he certainly does seem to be. And while the, the Christian sources, one of their tendencies on the whole is to play down, first of all, any sense that John might be superior to Jesus, um, but also any sense that John might be, you know, that Jesus might be a disciple of John's. And one interesting thing in the Mandaean sources is that it uses a term which later in the development of the Mandaic language, comes to mean um, basically to become ordained, right? To be, go into the priesthood of the Mandaean religion. But the root of it comes from the Aramaic word for disciple. And so Jesus goes to John and they have this, what I think is if you, assuming you, you know, if you're a Christian, you might need to have a thick skin to read this and find it amusing. But they have this, they do this wonderful satire and wordplay as they engage in polemic against, you know, groups that they disagree with. And so they have this retelling of the story of Jesus going to John to be baptized. And there may be some independent tradition in the Mendian texts that gets there independently of and yet intersects with Christian sources like the New Testament gospels, for instance. There are others where they read just like a rewriting of the stories we already know from the New Testament gospels but a satirical take on them. And the story of Jesus being baptized by John certainly could be that, right? He goes, Jesus goes to John and says, John, make me your disciple and I'll mention you in this epistle that I'm gonna write. It's like, you know, there's a book I'm gonna publish. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna name drop, you know, you're gonna get a shout out in my book and stuff like that. And it, I mean, it's, it's hilarious. I mean, just partly because, you know, well, first of all, Jesus doesn't write a book, but the idea of him like, author of the epistles and stuff like that. I mean, if you're, you're familiar with the New Testament, it's like, okay. And then John is refusing, not because he thinks that Jesus is so much greater that he needs to be baptized by Jesus, but because he thinks Jesus is gonna go off the rails and you know take his teaching and twist it and do all kinds of problematic stuff. And the Mandaeans blame Jesus for everything that Christianity comes up with later that they disagree with, including like, monks and nuns and celibacy and all kinds of other stuff. So there's all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Uh, not all of which, and in some cases, not any of which is necessarily historical. But John comes across as a key figure and there's definitely some rivalry there. And we get a sense of rivalry in the New Testament as well. At the very least, in terms of followers of each of these figures debating about them and which of them is greater and which of them they should be focusing their attention on. Uh, Professor McGrath, uh, there are two questions I quickly saw uh, shoot up. One is from Shannon Buzzard and the other is Justin. Um, Shannon, uh, is it okay, Professor McGrath, if, if we take a moment to, for them to clarify some things with you? Yeah, absolutely. And Shannon, is, what's there your a Q &A? is there a Q&A? I just, thing? Want, is it just, I just wanted to mention uh, that in the readings I've done so far, um, both in Dunn's work, and I also have a separate one by Buckley, um, yeah. that yeah. I'm starting to get even more interested in them than I was before in, the, uh, in them. And one of the areas of interest for me is Mirai. So if you can touch on any of that material, I'd be very interested as well. Yeah, so... Uh... Yeah, in, in modern Mandaic, they pronounce her name, uh, you know, almost Murie is, you know, but it's Miriai is basically a, you know, it's a form of Miriam, right? So it's a form of the name Mary. And there have sometimes been suggestions that that's either Mary Magdalene, their version of her, or Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, I'm not persuaded that it's either. I mean, I'm open to either of those possibilities or that they're blurring the two, um, among other things. But the stories they tell about her don't actually overlap with anything we're told about Jesus or Jesus' mother or about a follower of Jesus named Mary. Uh, she does have a connection with John the Baptist, though, which is interesting. 
But there's a fascinating story, and she's actually where I started dipping my toe into uh, Mandayan studies. So it wasn't an uncommon name in those times. So it could be somebody completely independent, or it could be an amalgamation of both Mary Magdalene as well as the mother of Mary in different places being used without being separated for, uh, for our benefit, as it were. Yeah. And they do tend to make a distinction and use Miriam for Jesus' mother and Mary for the, the other person, but it's not always consistent. And so whether the, that distinction came about later or actually reflects, you know, a root sense, you know, a sense all along that these are different people is harder to say. But yeah, starting to find the, their literature fascinating. Murray just grabs your interest because here's this, you know, woman who goes and finds her way, you know, in a Jewish context to this meeting of this esoteric group. And there are men and women involved in teaching and doing all kinds of things there. And so she's intrigued, she hangs around, she falls asleep, she gets home late. Her father is incensed and accuses her of, you know, sleeping around and doing all, calls her all kinds of colorful names that are like quite shocking and things like that. But then Murray basically becomes, you know, essentially she's depicted as a Mandayan priest. And the question of whether women were priests at one point, you know, is an interesting one to ask. Um, it's not part of their current practice, but as with Christianity, uh, so too with Mandaism, we need to allow for change over time. And the fact that Sometimes things that, you know, sometimes a tradition that's uh, inclusive gets more exclusive. One that's more uh, egalitarian gets more patriarchal, sometimes the reverse. And so, but she's a fascinating figure. And she was my first step into this world. And so there's actually a paper of mine on Murier, um, on uh, what's known as my selected works page. So if you go to if you Google James McGrath selected works, you'll you'll find it, or just James McGrath and you know her name, I think you'll find it. But there's I think an interesting similarity with the Gospel of John, in that it seems to suggest that the Mandaeans emerge in a Jewish context, just as Christianity does, and then there's controversy with like synagogue authorities or something like that, or temple authorities or whoever it is. And then there is a separation and some kind of parting of the ways. And in my view, I think that uh, the Mandaeans probably do start out within a, a Jewish or at least an Israelite context. And so I'm actually presenting this, um, wait, I'm trying to figure out what day of the week it is. Sorry, with, with all this working from home, things get blurry. But yeah, I'm actually presenting later this week in um, the meeting that's happening online this week of the Enoch seminar, uh, which is focused on evil and talking about the problem of evil and the origins of Gnosticism. And I think that Mandayan sources actually give us some really important insight into that question. And that's also something that I'm wondering whether that's going to be a separate research project or whether it's going to be part of the, just part of the work that I do on John the Baptist. Uh, because I think that one can argue the case that John is maybe one of, certainly one of the most, but maybe the most influential religious figure in history. I mean, he intersects with Jewish immersion and whether it's a reaction against him or taking things from him or a bit of both, what Jewish immersion looks like after that probably reflects some engagement with him and you know, his views and his practices. Uh, he influences Christianity. Uh, he's mentioned in Islam. Uh, does he also influence, uh, does his circle of influence and followers give rise to Gnosticism as well? And in what ways and in what sense? And so this is a very interesting figure. Uh, to skip ahead just a little to something that is associated with him, uh, there, there, there may have been others Right, so John is depicted as talking about one who will come after him. And although Christian sources are like, and in case you didn't get the memo, that's Jesus. But John doesn't actually come out and say that. 
in general, although in the Gospel of John, it's like, yeah, no, no, he's greater, and it's, it's, it's all very clear cut. Precisely because it doesn't identify Jesus explicitly in the, the versions we get in you know, the Synoptic Gospels, I'm inclined to think that there's probably some, some, something historical there. And so one interesting question I have about John's influence is, are any of those other figures that we read about in sources like Josephus, where somebody goes and expects, you know, it's like the Mount of Olives is going to split and we're going to, you know, or the walls of Jerusalem are going to come falling down or, you know, the Jordan's going to part or, you know, all these reenactments of signs from the past or predicting of signs for the future. All these figures get compared to Jesus because there are these intriguing similarities, right? Could all of these people emerge from the circle around John? And it's like, maybe I'm going to be the one who is to come. Maybe I'm going to be the one who is to come. Uh -huh. And there's this fascinating possibility there that I'm looking forward to exploring. Uh, Matthew, I like the look on your face there. Uh, so that's one of those things that's going to go into this book, which I'm unfortunately on in the early phases of. Um, and I will resist the temptation to tell you what the books are that I'm trying to finish up this summer, because that could distract us as well. Even though I, I'm sure I could bring the discussion back. I'm usually pretty good at that. But also, uh, those things are relevant as well. Um, I will mention one of them, which is directly relevant to this class. And I'm pretty sure that if, if we talk about some of that, Matthew won't mind because it's, unless he's got somebody else lined up to talk about precisely that. But one book that I'm hoping I can finish very, very soon, at least in draft form, and then get some feedback on a completed draft is called What Jesus Learned from Women. And so the theme of Jesus learning, you know, and who are the influences on him is clearly something that has my broad interest because I'm doing that and then I'm also working on John the Baptist and so I think that looking at figures who influence someone you know, is important because whether you're carrying on whether you're reinterpreting whether you're reacting against uh, those influences are important and understanding those influences always gives us a more robust understanding of someone and so even if you're here and it's like you know, hurry up with John so we can get back to Jesus. You know, focusing on John is, I think, really in, in some ways essential if we're to make sense of Jesus in a meaningful way, or at least in the fullest way that we can in view of the sources that we have. Professor McGrath, uh, just so you know, the, the format of this usually is that um, by the end of the two hour mark, um, it, presumably if it takes that long to get through all the main points, um, anything beyond that point becomes free game for any discussion. So, so okay. if you if we get to the end of this and you still are 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 you know as passionately desiring to talk about your other projects, I'm sure there are many people here who will be just as passionate to continue on with the class uh, optionally to just keep listening. But on that point, um, I know that Justin had a question I mentioned, but. His question was before Shannon's, and Joseph asked a question in the chat that relates to what Shannon said. So, um, Joseph, would I'll let you go first, just because that way we can close the Miriam discussion uh, before uh, be Mary discussion before we move to whatever Justin wants to ask. Yeah, so I see that question about um, the development of essentially Mariology, right, in uh, Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, I'm not inclined to think there's a, a direct connection, just because I'm not sure it's the same, the same Mary, as it were. And Mary doesn't become really a sort of a savior figure or an intermediary. There are some really interesting intermediaries, and there's some light world figures, like celestial realm figures, uh, savior figures, uh, both male and female. But uh, Mary doesn't uh, doesn't sort of play that role, but there may be a connection in as much as I think that some things that go back into the like pre-exilic you know, polytheistic types of religiosity that you got in ancient Israel persist and have something to do with the origins of Gnosticism in general and Mandaism in particular. And some of those things, right, the sense that the focus on one deity who is gendered male excludes you know, 
much of the divine and much of you know, the celestial realm seems to invite back such a figure. And so I think that there's a sense in which in Mandaism, there's more, there's more room for that sort of thing. And so there's less of a sense of a need for uh, a human figure to, to take on that kind of role. Um, there's probably more that could be said about that. But I do think just for those who might be interested, there are probably much greater similarities and a possibility of shared connection, right, by way of the synagogue and the fact that I think Mandaism emerges from there. Uh, and Mandaism in particular emerges from there in a Mesopotamian context, it seems. There seem to be direct connections with uh, Jewish mysticism, right, that are connected with much more sort of mainstream and orthodox forms of Judaism than um, any direct connection with things that we see in Christianity. That's interesting. Justin, would you do you still have that question on the tip of your tongue from from back then? Why not? Why not? And you, and if either of you, uh, Matthew or James, if you have some perspective here, this may end up just be a, a touching note. But if you've got any uh, uh, feedback or info to fuel this, um, I'm curious if you guys have any um, thoughts on scholarship that the Book of Revelation is in part composed by um, a, a community of followers of John the Baptist. And I think a primary um, sort of presenter of that idea whose, uh, whose work has been largely glossed over has been Elaine Ford uh, with her commentary on Revelation in the Anchor Bible commentary series and and that's her perspective is for example that chapters 4 to 11 were written previous to the rest and that those were composed by a community of John the Baptist's followers and I for, for my own perusal I just haven't heard um, a lot of other scholars entertaining that conversation and so I'd be curious to hear um, thoughts from uh, either or both of you on that if you have any. Yeah, so Revelation is one of the sources that I haven't dug into yet. Um, certainly plan on revisiting that. Uh, to be honest, the book of Revelation is one of the texts in the New Testament that I have done the least with. Um, maybe it was left with a, I should say a bitter taste in my mouth, right? Like eating the scroll. Um, there's a nice multifaceted uh, biblical illusion there that's maybe just perfect, but um, for those for those who get it, which it looks like is pretty much this is the right crowd to make that kind of joke in. But there, you know, had had some exposure to some of that, you know, sort of you know futuristic, you know, conservative Christian type approach to Revelation that can uh, lead you to focus your attention elsewhere for a little while, let's say. But one of the questions I do want to look at is where do we see the influence of John the Baptist in the New Testament, right? And of course, there are some things that are attributed to him, things that he may have said, uh, some little bits of teaching, you know, very early on. And there are two, there are two points, you know, one is, to what extent has he influenced Jesus so that some of the emphases of Jesus are, in fact, emphases of John? And then also, where are some things that come up in later Christian literature as Christians are trying to make sense of Jesus and who he is and his death after the fact, right, looking back, how much of that reflects things that, you know, some of them inherited from John and then bring into the picture, which, you know, maybe don't show up earlier, right? And so Revelation is one of the places where I will focus attention and I promise to reconnect with you if, uh, if we can share contact information or something like that and uh, tell you more about that or share things I'm working on. Uh, I did stick uh, religion prof, which is you know what I'm known by on Twitter and also the title of my blog, uh, just so that if anyone wants to connect with me, you can find me there. And anything that I do related to the Mandaeans or John the Baptist or Jesus or any of that stuff uh, ends up there, one of those places. And if there are any questions that you have after the fact, please ask them because you know things like this you know are the kind of things that help me, not just remember to 
explore some things that, you know, it's like one scholar, one commentary really, you know, elaborated this hypothesis, right? Not the only person to mention it, but the only person to really run with it seriously. And it's the sort of thing that could get left to one side as you, you know, have this massive stuff that you're working on. And so uh, being reminded of things as well as finding out what people find interesting, you know, because there have been plenty of times when I thought, yeah, I don't know if I'll work on that. Who's a, who else but me is going to find that interesting? And then somebody says something and I'm like, yes, good, okay. There's at least one person who'll read that chapter and, uh, you know, may not agree with what I say, but will at least, you know, have appreciated, you know, will geek out with me about, the, you know, this particular topic. So one of the places where I think we almost definitely see the influence of John on Jesus is in the saying about the temple being destroyed and rebuilt. And I will tell you why. Uh, there, are a couple, there are a few things. But one of them is something that I've long I long found intriguing, and it only came into a sort of sharper focus once I started working on John the Baptist in his own right. And even though I share the interest that I assume most, if not all of you have in Jesus in his own right, but I think that John, focusing on John in his own right is worthwhile, but also is the best way to then bring that into conversation with Jesus and say, okay, so now that we've tried to hear John in his own terms, how does the picture look? If we look at the Synoptic Gospels versus the Gospel of John, and I'm going to guess, since you've already, you're already several classes in, talking about sources, that's something that's come up, probably, yeah. So, uh, But one of the things that the Gospel of John does is place the incident in the temple. Uh, some people call it the cleansing of the temple, but it's not clear that it's actually, a, uh, my favorite way of referring to it is the temple tantrum. But uh, that's just because I like puns. And I think it's actually a, a well-planned symbolic action and not a you know, spur of the moment, Jesus got angry sort of thing. But John's placement of it, the Gospel of John's placement of that has some interesting facets about it, right? So one is that the Jewish authorities are made to say, you know, when he says, you know, destroy his temple and I'll rebuild it, they say it's been built for 46 years. Um, if I'm remembering, I have a terrible head for numbers. Um, then again, I've been in the Gospel of John for so long, I really ought to get all the numbers right, even the, you know, number of fish and everything else. But that's actually pretty precisely the number of years, you know, that Herod's renovation project would have been going on if one places the ministry of Jesus in the time frame that it usually is placed by historians and places that action towards the start of Jesus' activity. And so there's this alignment. Could it be coincidence? Sure, right? But is it likely? Or is it more likely that maybe there was actually some historical memory there? I think we should consider that. And one of the things that's interesting is that as we continue reading the Gospel of John, John still has a public activity at this point, which the other Gospels, you know, that's, they get John out of the way before they start talking about that. And so when Jesus, if Jesus says that, and that's extremely plausible that he says something about the temple being destroyed and rebuilt in conjunction with an action that many scholars think symbolizes the destruction of the temple, because if you get rid of the sacrificial animals being sold, you're interfering with the very reason to be of the temple, right? It's not just a cleansing. It is interference with the, the actual reason that's there. Putting the saying, which the other gospels are embarrassed by, it's like, yeah, no, he didn't say it. Well, he said that, but it was, um, you know, all he said is, I'm able to destroy this temple. And we all know he's able, but he didn't, you know, and, you know. There's all this embarrassment about it that if you learned about the criteria, um, whether favorably or unfavorably, uh, there certainly is something just generally as a principle of historical study to the criterion of embarrassment, right? When people are doing damage control about something, it's usually something that's widely known and they can't just, you know, ignore it. Uh, they're mentioning it because they feel like they've got to do something with it. That doesn't prove it's historical. It does prove that it's something that's more widely known and not just being invented by that author. 
And from a historian's perspective, that's significant, right? And so if John's activity is still going on, is this actually happening during the period when Jesus is still associated with John's movement? And so is that essentially a message from John? You know, I think that's a possibility worth considering. Um, is it at the very least something that reflects Jesus being still very profoundly influenced by John and John's emphasis? And so I think that's something to consider. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew actually is interesting in that it summarizes the message of John the Baptist in exactly the same words that it summarizes the message of Jesus, right? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So there's a lot of early Christian acknowledgement that the message of the two uh, at least overlaps and intersects and aligns, as we would expect if John is a major influence on Jesus. Right? So I think that that saying about the temple being destroyed, and again, what, what does that mean? Is it, I will destroy, is that like a prophetic word like God is going to destroy it? Is it uh, I, John, or I, Jesus, or I and my movement from either or both of them is going to destroy this? Or is that literally going to tear it down? Or is it going to render it ineffective and replace it with something really different, not made with human hands? John's baptism I think is a natural place for us to go next because I think there's a connection between John's baptism and a major question that historians have about John's baptism and that theme. But I want to check, were there any other questions? Um, and I realize we're not getting as much into the uh, book of Revelation and that's mostly because I got distracted by something else I thought was really interesting, but also because uh, I think there may be some things in the book of Revelation um, and I have yet to dig into that as fully because I'm still trying to finish off a couple of other writing projects and sink my teeth more deeply into that project. But I, I do can... think there is one other thing that might be there, uh, which again would lead us maybe naturally to, by way of the book of Revelation and the letter to the, Hebrew, uh, uh, to the Hebrews, uh, to the question of the baptismal practice. So Hebrews and the book of Revelation have something in common that I think is interesting. Uh, it's the notion that there's this essentially celestial temple, right? Or tabernacle, right? And that's an interesting idea, right? And if you ask, where might you get the idea that there is a celestial temple, right? And then where might you get the idea that there can be waters that provide like the same function that sacrifice does? Because that's one of the major questions. That's what I was alluding to. Is John's baptism for the forgiveness of sins, which Josephus seems eager to say, well, not really. It's like it's purity because you've already been forgiven because you repent. It's like, baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Christians don't have a reason to invent that because they want John to be about Jesus as the source of forgiveness of sins. So why make that up? Is John's baptism for the forgiveness of sins essentially an alternative to sacrifice? And is John offering that, is that how he's going to destroy the temple? Right? He's offering a free alternative to the sacrificial system. Right? Where would you get the idea that there could be a celestial temple and streams of water maybe flowing from that temple that then reach earth and you can immerse yourself in them and experience that? You know. Anyone have Ezekiel coming to mind? Um, maybe. Right? But there's this vision at the end there. Uh, which is fascinating, right? And there is a whole tradition of, you know, Ezekiel's vision there being of a, you know, not so much a future earthly temple, but of possibly a, a celestial one. And I was like, well, is that just a quirky thing or is that? And then you find that people like Philo of Alexandria say, you know, read things like in the Psalms where it says, there's a river that makes glad the city of God. And he's like, well, you know, there's, you know, there isn't really a river, you know, Jerusalem. So clearly that's the celestial Jerusalem. And I'm like, oh, yes, good. Okay. It's not just, you know, a little here, a little there. That's, there are lots of people thinking in those terms. But I wonder about the possibility of the influence of Ezekiel and the idea of a celestial atonement on John, with water being the way that that gets then sort of delivered to earth and access to it gets delivered to earth. If so, then 
however much the author of the letter to the Hebrews, for instance, might be influenced by Platonism as well. You know, that idea of a celestial temple is not just something that comes out of interaction with Greek philosophy, right? In fact, we have, you know, mentions in Jewish literature of, you know, patterns of stars being woven on the, the, the curtain in the temple and things like that, that it, it basically, entry into the, the Holy of Holies is like going into the heavens where God dwells. And there's essentially a, a celestial counterpart to this. And that comes from Ezekiel 2, right? Where you, not Ezekiel 2, I should say Ezekiel 1, or Ezekiel as well, but where you get the, the vision of you know, the wheels within wheels and the strange creatures. And if you read Eric von Däniken, you know, it sees a UFO. Um, and of course it is, because he's not sure what he's seeing. So it is an unidentified flying object, I guess. But, you know, not aliens, right? I'm not doing the ancient aliens thing. Um, that's a side interest of mine. And it's mostly debunking that, although it's, it, it makes for some really cool sci-fi, assuming you like Stargate and stuff like that. But what Ezekiel is seeing is essentially the celestial version of the, the temple, of the Ark of the Covenant, right? Of the throne of God with the you know, cherubs on either side, right? That's Ark of the Covenant imagery. The Ark of the Covenant goes missing around this time. And Ezekiel's like, don't worry about it, right? And don't worry that the presence of God is in Jerusalem because you know, here's God on wheels and can, can join us in, you know, join us in Babylon and join us elsewhere. It seems as though a lot of those ideas are actually much more widespread in Judaism, or at least in Israelite tradition. Uh, but some of those persist more at the fringes of Judaism. And some of them actually are problematic from the perspective of you know, a Torah-focused kind of thing, right? So Ezekiel's temple seems to be different from the one that there are instructions for in the Jewish scriptures. What's that about, right? And could John give rise indirectly to Gnosticism, if not directly, by taking an approach that says, yeah, there's a, there's a way of getting forgiveness that's not the sacrificial system outlined in Torah, right? And so there's a little bit more picking and choosing. Jesus carries that on to at least some extent. It's like, Moses gave you that for the hardness of, because of the hardness of your hearts, but that's not God's ideal, playing some scriptures off against others. The Gnostics maybe just take that in a, you know, a different and more radical direction. Professor McGrath, um, yes. would you allow me, since you want to, us to talk about the baptism episode, would you allow me to quickly review for everyone um, the, the synoptic material? Absolutely. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and pull up a document I had prepared for this. So everyone here can see my, my Word doc with the scripture on the screen. Someone give me a thumbs up so I, I know. All right, good, thank you. Um, so in the Gospel of Mark, well, actually what's true about all the Synoptic Gospels, right, is the, um, the text regarding uh, Isaiah is always presented with relationship to John the Baptist, which I personally find interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, when you start seeing it pop up every single time in each of the Synoptic accounts, Yes, it could be related to simply the fact that Mark did it and they're copying. On the other hand, it kind of makes you wonder, was Isaiah potentially a scripture John the Baptist historically drew on a lot? Or did John the Baptist himself identify himself with relation to the figure in the wilderness crying, or his disciples did? And of course, it's interesting that in the Gospel of John, it actually does identify uh, John the Baptist himself stating that this scripture is in relationship to him. So it's interesting that, you know, there is this tradition of Isaiah and John the Baptist that keeps popping up even in John, um, which if we're trying to think about the historical John the Baptist is one a clue among many to think through what would interest me, especially as a question to Professor McGrath as after we go through this, what was the teachings of the historical John the Baptist? So when we, uh, not looking at the accounts of Jesus' baptism uh, precisely uh, just yet, I want to note that uh, when Mark gives his account, uh, 
It describes it as uh, John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness. I, I was saying on Sunday, this is kind of like, you know, um, a surprise pop-up. It's like, you know, hello, everybody. Uh, you know, just like the Gospels give you this impression that no one knew who he was. Like, obviously, people knew who he was at some point when he was growing up. And then everyone must have just forgot about him when he went to the wilderness, joined the Essenes or whatever happened. And then he just pops out of nowhere. And suddenly he's the figure now that everyone can't stop talking about. Um, the claim by Mark is he proclaims a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Um, and you could read that, as I said on Sunday, you could read that and assume that this in some sense means that you are replacing the sacrificial system. And uh, as Professor McGrath also pointed out, on the other hand, we have Josephus when he mentions this and he's like, no, 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 no. That is not that simple. No, no. This was a symbolic act after they changed their ways, it was just a kind of like uh, a little seal on them to say, yes, I did change. Um, but then again, Josephus is from the Pharisees uh, kind of community. So the gospels present John the Baptist as having some conflicts with the Pharisees. So, and the fact that the, all of the leadership in Judea, like the Sadducees and Pharisees, did not want to endorse John the Baptist, but they didn't want to like put him down during his lifetime and afterwards, because according to the Gospels, they knew the crowds loved him. So, I mean, we, who knows? There might be background there to make us doubt whether or not Josephus is the most impartial background for evaluating what John the Baptist's teachings were. I'd be definitely interested in hearing uh, Professor McGrath bring that into conversation. But um, the possibilities are obviously there. We can't just discount what Josephus says. But the only thing Mark quotes John the Baptist as teaching is the statement of a prophecy that is obviously applied to Jesus. The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, one interesting point, right, is if he baptizes with water and the one coming is with the Holy Spirit, right, the one coming you assume is like a Messiah figure, is the judgmental figure. The, and so the Holy Spirit here kind of rings more apocalyptic than it does Christian. So you, you, you expect not like cute tongues of fire above people's head, more like flames engulfing the world and judgment. Uh, which is exactly, as we move from Mark, what we get in uh, Matthew and Luke. So in um, Matthew, again, like Luke, they have the Isaiah statement. And then uh, what's interesting here is, you know, Matthew says that uh, John is kind of a wild man, uh, that the people of Jerusalem and all Judea are going out to him, all the region. Uh, but when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So first of all, uh, John the Baptist is kind of portrayed in a really, um, a really negative light for, for many modern people. He's kind of like, damn it, I didn't want you guys. Like, who, who gave you the message? So, you know, like, no, the other people, fine, but you guys... Um, so there is this vindictiveness you can almost sense a little bit there. Like this is a harsh apocalyptic message and John clearly has, or is presented by Matthew in particular, is having specific figures that he judges in his, uh, contemporary community. So, um, he seems to critique them saying that, you know, you think because of Abraham as your ancestor that that will help you. By the way, that kind of is reminiscent of like, the Gospel of John with some of the things Jesus says about these groups. It's kind of interesting to notice that parallel. Um, but notice the apocalyptic language. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, right? So, you know, Mark never used the word fire, but now you kind of assume the Holy Spirit would be connected to it. Now we have it in Matthew. And then Matthew even adjusts the statement about baptism so that he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor. 
gathering weed and you know burn unquenchable fire. So it's very apocalyptic, right? Um, we see here a John the Baptist that looks fiery and angry and wild and crazy. So when we go to Luke, it's interesting, right? Because Luke makes that claim in the very beginning of his gospel that he like did better than the other gospels. He went further. He tried to do more. Um, and of course, obviously, Luke takes liberties in terms of what he's doing. Um, and of course, it's hard sometimes to know whether or not, like in particular, the baptism episode, right? Because if we accept the Q hypothesis, then we're dealing here potentially with Q material. But Matthew and Luke don't exactly agree perfectly. So then there's always going to be a debate as to what elements within these two texts are reflecting um, the Lucan or Matthew redaction of whatever Q originally said. Putting that question aside, though, because, of course, hypotheticals and Mark Goodacre and all that good stuff. Um, <laughs> Professor McGrath's smile. <laughs> um, it's interesting to note, right, that it tells us in Luke that John the Baptist went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming baptism, then gives the quotation. But then it says something really confusing, right? Uh, John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, right? This is different. In Matthew, he says this to the Pharisees and Sadducees. In Luke, he says it to everybody which doesn't even make sense within Luke's narrative because Luke already said that he was proclaiming this to the crowds. But now within Luke's narrative, he's mad at the crowds. Like you brood of vipers, all of you, <laughs> like who warned you, any of you to flee? Like according to Luke, it was John the Baptist who warned them to flee and now is critiquing them. So maybe that being the harder reading, maybe Matthew changed that and that reflects Q potentially because it, it's like, well, John the Baptist is against everybody. And Matthew's like, no, 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 no. Who knows? I'm not going to stake a claim on that. But it is interesting that there's a disagreement. Was John the Baptist against everybody or just specific groups? Um, but what's interesting is we get that same, same passage from Q potentially regarding um, the axe at the tree and the fire. But then Luke adds something that's really unique. He adds teachings of John the Baptist things that are not found anywhere else. And so we start in verse 10, the crowds asked him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none and whoever has food must do likewise. Okay, well, immediately that sounds like Jesus. Like there's echoes there of the Sermon on the Mount and, and you know, like there's, and it's interesting too, given that this, this is Luke, not Matthew. Um, and then even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. Be satisfied with your wages. Now, what I find fascinating about this, first of all, this is the only time that we get non-apocalyptic teachings of John the Baptist. But what really disturbs me as a historian, kind of, is that none of this sounds like the same guy who everyone else is talking about, or even Luke. Like, we get this portrait of an apocalyptic, the one's coming, we're all going to pay. And then we've got, like, a very kind of um, moderate a portrait of John the Baptist being like, be satisfied with your wages. Don't abuse. Don't, you know, it's okay if you have to do these terrible things that the Romans want you to do, but just, but just don't, don't, don't abuse it. You know, don't go beyond the abuse they've already given you, right? It, it's not very apocalyptic. It's not, it doesn't make me think this is the, the, I mean, maybe the whoever has two coats must, okay, maybe. But the other two statements really come across as like, you know, more of a, a hippie kind of let's all get along kind of John the Baptist, not like apocalyptic. So it's, it's, it really gets me interested. Again, another point I want Professor McGrath to, to reflect on, like, well, what does this tell us about John the Baptist if by the 80s we've got these statements, which are not, again, interestingly enough, they're not, these other two statements are not reflective of the Jesus tradition. They're not something we would see with Jesus. So the question is, you know, how did these, this portrait get connected with this apocalyptic figure? Is John the Baptist different? Is he multidimensional? I mean, there's a lot of questions that could go there. Um, obviously, Luke continues with the issue of 
um, the one coming. And specifically, all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he'd be the Messiah. Um, and John answered all of them by saying, so first of all, it's just interesting to note, there is this tradition that it looked like John the Baptist could be the Messiah. And if everyone was questioning it, that means his disciples were questioning it, which means that probably, um, you know, since we get told, right, that Apollos was still going on proclaiming the, the message and, and so forth uh, of John the Baptist without knowing about Jesus, I wouldn't be surprised, right, if there were people who followed John the Baptist who even after his death still thought he might be the Messiah of some sort. Um, what the implications of that might be are interesting, right, because that would be another person who thinks the Messiah already came and died a, that wasn't a Christian. Um, if it's possible for Christians to do it, I kind of suspect it was possible for someone like John the Baptist to do it. Um, and Professor McGrath, of course, doesn't know about our discussions of the parables of Enoch uh, and specifically chapter 47 in regards to the righteous one's blood and the debate over uh, whether or not that is the singular righteous one Messiah or whether that is the collective singular uh, plural community. Um, we had a fun discussion on that, Professor McGrath, and, and, and try, me trying to help them both sympathize with my unorthodox view of the Enochic text with trying to represent the more mainstream John Collins, you know, that definite uh, Nicholsburg Vanderkam, that's definitely not uh, the Righteous One Messiah view. But interesting point I raised there in that class is if it's possible to read it a certain way, what makes us think that it was not possible for other groups in the case like the earliest Christians or in the case of, if it's there and could be interpreted that way, it's hard to dismiss that it was possibly, you know, not by someone. Um, so anyways, putting that to the side. So uh, it says in Luke, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news, the gospel to the people. So interesting, again, Luke is attributing the gospel not to Jesus like Mark would have done it, where it's like, oh, John is the prelude that leads to Jesus proclaiming the gospel. Luke here just tells us the gospel starts with John the Baptist, which is, again, interesting given all the other things he's added to the story. Um, obviously, the gospel of John gets a lot less... Um, a lot less uh, historical in terms, I feel like, about its portrayal of John the Baptist. Uh, he gets questioned as to who are you? Uh, are you Elijah? And it's kind of interesting that are you Elijah? The answer is I am not. Are you the prophet? John writes, you know, and he answered no. And then they said, who are you? Um, let us have an answer. And then he quotes the prophet Isaiah talking about a prophet in the wilderness. So it's also kind of like double speak. No, I'm not a prophet. Who am I? Would well, you remember the words of the prophet about the prophet in the wilderness? <laughs> it's like, um, okay, so you are and you aren't a prophet. Okay. Um, but also kind of interesting because it kind of presents in John's gospel, John the Baptist as kind of an elusive figure, uh, which is kind of similar to Jesus's style of teaching, right? Jesus is like, well, you said it. You said it. You ain't gonna hold me down. Mm -mm, you said it. Um, and in particular, Dr. McGrath, we've been talking in this class about noting very carefully in Q, in Mark, in Thomas, um, how often there are contradictions, per se, where Jesus will say one thing in the document and then totally contradict or go the opposite angle. Um, sometimes in regards to doctrines, yes, um, you know, uh, taking interest is bad. Yes, interest is good. Um, like some very interesting contradictions, but uh, we've been trying to kind of look at the reason why Q, Mark, and Thomas all remember Jesus as a disturbing, offensive individual. Why, these, um, why this reputation, Mark says, caused most of the crowds to not understand anything that he had to say. Like there's all these interesting traditions that overall have kind of been passed over in a lot of historical Jesus uh, treatments, but they kind of underscore the mystery of why Jesus generates so many diverse portraits. But it's curious then that in John's gospel, John the Baptist kind of has this kind of uh, introduction to him 
that he's somewhat elusive with the crowds. No, I'm not this, but yeah, I, I kind of am this. Um, and, you know, since Jesus is presented as having come to be a student of John the Baptist, seeing a similarity there is, of course, of interest. Um, then I also pointed out two other extra canonical gospels, like the Gospel of the Hebrews, um, you know, which just doesn't add much to this. It just shows uh, a, na a narrative imagination of Jesus' family hearing, uh, you know, like other Judeans about something about John the Baptist. Let's go get him, you know. This is presumably what all the Judeans in the story are hearing, which is why they're rushing out to the wilderness. Um, the Gospel of the Ebionites, uh, this one, what was interesting about this? Um, yeah, there really isn't too much that it, it added, uh, except referencing the Zechariah and Elizabeth genealogy. Um, uh, oh, and that uh, John was interested in a baptism that changed people's hearts. Uh, so a uh, very specific emotional. But um, I, yeah, I guess going back now to Professor McGrath um, about uh, the character of John the Baptist specifically, um, the question I would have for you uh, as you guide us in whatever discussion regarding the figure of John the Baptist is sort of what do we make of his reputation, the teaching like that Luke provides us, which doesn't seem to match our expectations and, you know, any of the points that were raised, you know, are free game for you to go at. Um, but one thing I did mention on Sunday is I find it great to look at the historical John the Baptist because he's more prevalent, he's more acknowledged, right? Especially if you think about mythicists who, you know, atheist mythicists who, you know, want to argue that Jesus is, is, does not have historical credibility, right? John the Baptist does, right? He has independent attestation, you know, there's enough sources, you can really make an argument this was the real guy, right? He, he was at some point in time, he left a mark. Josephus, whether he mentions Jesus or not, you can debate that, but it does appear that he mentions John the Baptist. Um, and what is interesting is for a guy who was so popular, and as you said, you know, possibly the most influential figure for so many, um, and yet we probably know less I assume, and correct me if I'm wrong, less historical based record knowledge of who he actually was or what he even taught, uh, uh, you know, specifically than we do for Jesus. But anyway, yeah. so that's an interesting point. By studying him, we can kind of appreciate the riches of what we have for sources on the historical Jesus, despite the fact that we're always, you know, lamenting how little we have. But okay, I've said my, I've said enough. The floor is back to you, Dr. McGrath. Yeah, well, I'm going to try and touch briefly on a number of things you mentioned, um, and then we can come back to any of them that there's interest in going into more, but I'm going to try and touch on several of them briefly just because you mentioned a whole lot of things that I want to make sure I at least say something about, uh, because I think they're, they're fairly important. Uh, one, uh, you asked about sort of the reach and influence of John, and one thing that I think you know, I'm a, I'm a city boy, you know, this is, you know, I was as guilty of this as anyone else probably, but you know, hear Judean wilderness and you think, okay, he's out in the middle of nowhere, you know, he's a, a hermit and he's like, you know, crazy guy running around among the rocks with, you know, this guy has disciples all over the place and has, you know, like kings and religious authorities worried about it. Does that, fit. I don't know. And a thing that we are liable to forget is that, you know, the Judean wilderness is, you know, the whole area that stretches from, you know, out in the remote areas, you know, Qumran and places like that, along, you know, Jericho, the Jordan River Valley, Jerusalem, this is all the, the Judean wilderness area. And so we don't need to turn him into a, a hermit, per se. Um, he's active in that region, and mainly near the Jordan. Uh, one question I have, you know, uh, is about how much he might have been associated with any particular one place or whether his baptism moved around to places where there was water. Uh, because it does seem that he baptized, right, not just that um, 
you know, he told people about, you know, you can just immerse yourself, you know, at your convenience and get forgiveness. And so there's that which we might want to think about. But the traditional location of the baptism of Jesus is also, you know, in Judaism, the traditional location of the Israelites crossing into the promised land. And we have no real evidence that I know of that that identification of the site goes back to you know, a very early time period. And there's a lot of tendency to say, you know, well, if you're going to be building stuff here and there's going to be a gift shop and, you know, convenience, you know, <laughs> place for refreshments, then this will be our sacred site too. You know, this is where this happened, you know. So there's a lot of sharing of sacred space in the Holy Land. But the possibility that there is like an exodus, conquest, you know, repeating that story uh, motif in there, either in baptism, wherever it happens, or maybe even tied with one of the places that he particularly liked to do it or something like that is intriguing. One thing that I think should be highlighted as part of his, his teaching and his emphases, um, moving to his, and I want to make sure I come back to his baptism before we're done. So just don't let me, you know, Matthew, you know, it's like, j jot down a note, something like that, you know, baptism, you know, just say baptism and hopefully that'll be enough. It's, it doesn't seem like it would be, but I think it might. But focusing on his teaching and what he emphasized, you know, and his influence and things like that. One thing that I had down on my list of things that I think is important to talk about is uh, what some might call covenantal gnomism. Um, and that's a term that you almost never come across looking at the historical Jesus, but comes up regularly if you look at um, Paul and what's known as the new perspective on Paul, right? So it's the idea that in Judaism in this time, there's a focus on the covenant as granting, you know, particular forgiveness, special status, you know, you get, you're, you're the people of God and you're included in the promises. Others who are not part of this people are excluded pretty much by definition. There may be some rare exceptions, but that's kind of the way things is, uh, the way things are, I should say. Paul challenges that in saying that, you know, salvation is not through works of the law, like the works that are associated with Torah, but is something broader. And there seems to be a line that, you know, it's, it's less visible in the historical Jesus, but it does come through in places. But because we find it in Paul and we find it in John the Baptist, it's probably you know, a point of continuity from John into early Christianity. And that is you know, challenging that, right? Uh, that idea of don't think of yourselves as Abraham's children and think that gives you a special status, uh, that reemerges in Christianity. Uh, how much Jesus emphasized that or downplayed that vis-a-vis -vis his mentor, but Sometimes a seminal influence, a key influence figure, the next person in line doesn't do as much with it, but the broader influence is there and it shows up again, you know, as the tradition continues. And so there's, there's an interesting point of continuity there that's worth noting, right? And so by no means is he, does he seem to be opening things up to Gentiles or anything like that. But on the other hand, he may be laying some groundwork that others would then build on in interesting ways. Uh, the question of apocalyptic, I think, is another interesting one, because you know, John certainly seems to fit that kind of picture, but is that incompatible with ethical teaching uh, focused on things like economic justice? Uh, some of those things that you get in Luke are intriguingly similar to the kinds of things we find in Mandaean sources, right? The Mandaean book of John has John talking about, you know, don't, you know, yeah, things to do with marriage, uh, things to do with purity even a bit, but also things to do with, you know, asking for interest and those kinds of things. And so there's some striking, there's some interesting stuff there, if you'll um, accept the pun, right? uh, him talking about interest and collecting interest. But that's something that a lot of ethical teachers did. And so it's not necessarily a, a clear evidence that there is a commonality or shared source material or something like that. But given that Luke and the Mandaean Book of John also give, uh, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth, but with very different forms of the name, as the parents of John, and yet take those stories in very different directions. There is a real possibility that Luke and the Mandaeans might have had access to some material that stemmed from the circle of John's followers. It might be that Luke actually is incorporating some John-focused material in 
you know, in his infancy story and maybe in the teaching that he attributes to John. And so there's something I think very interesting there. The Perhaps coming one. Around. If, if yeah. I can ask, do you think sure. though, like not that ethical teaching is necessarily yeah. not in line with apocalyptic, but do you find that the kinds of ethical teaching that are given by Luke are more moderate than we'd even find in like the Jesus material? Like this is more like, it's okay that you do what you do, just do it this way. Right, whereas like the figure is supposed to be the end of the world is coming, right? Like you, the expectation is right. Like the way Jesus does things, he subverts them. He, he, he asks for a whole new way of life and and so forth. And and whereas what we have with these statements in Luke for John the Baptist is just more of a life can keep going the way that it is. You just need to not abuse where it's what is currently the status quo. It, it feels like more. Of, to me, it feels more of like a, a status quo prophet than it does the apocalyptic tradition of like, everything's going to change, you know, damn you Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, who brought you to come for repentance? You know, it seems like he's asking for quite a change in the repentance that he's talking about, whereas like the teachings that would go with that repentance aren't necessarily all that dramatic. Yeah, and it would take, it would take some real focused attention to try to puzzle out what's historical and then what it means when you put it all together in the sense that, you know, one possibility is that it's like you brood of vipers is aimed at the people who are confident that they have the status of, you know, belonging to God's chosen ones. And so don't need to worry too much. Whereas when it comes to the people that that very group would exclude, right, which um, also came up as an issue when Jesus is hanging out with the tax collectors and those folks, He's, John is like, yeah, so do this, you know, but you're welcome here, you know, and there's, so there's, a, there's an interesting potential point of continuity there. I think we can also fail to notice just how radical it would have been to say, only take what you're supposed to, to tax collectors, right? I mean, the whole reason people got into collecting taxes was that, you know, I mean, you had to be able to pay the amount up front, and then you take as much as you can, right? And that was sort of the whole reason for doing it, right? Very good point. Uh, so there's there's something there. It's like, I don't want to downplay just how significant that is. It's like, you know, it's it's not necessarily um, something not radical to say to, let's say, a, a CEO in our time, right, of a big corporation, you know, just, you know, take the, you know, the amount that you also pay your workers, right? I mean, that that would be, it's like, that's major change of lifestyle there, right? So, uh, yeah, I, it's, but it's hard to say, you know, I think the bigger question, you know, is, is John saying God is going to do something radical, get ready by living in a radical way? Uh, that's certainly one way of taking the teaching of Jesus. It's like, you know, sell all you have and do all this stuff because the kingdom of God is, is about to dawn and it's going to be this big uh, divinely initiated thing that comes about largely miraculously and boom, and takes you off guard. Is John also talking in those terms? Or when he says there's one coming after me and he's gonna you know, separate the wheat and the chaff and stuff like that, is he predicting that someone, whether it's a royal Davidic Messiah, whether it's a, an Elijah figure, whether it's some other kind of figure, somebody is gonna come and is gonna put the house in order. And it's gonna actually be a kind of this worldly activism. And the intriguing thing about that possibility is that it kind of reverses the, the, the way that John and Jesus are sometimes played off against one another because John is still apocalyptic, but he's being very concrete. And it's Jesus who then becomes the one who's much more focused on, uh, you know, God is going to do this thing. And, you know, we're not going to make it happen. All we can do is get ready. Yeah. And there's a lot more we could talk about in relation to that. But one of the things we might want to talk about and it might give me a chance to find out what Matthew's intriguing interest is in, you know, the Enochic literature and the similitudes or parables of Enoch and stuff like that. But is John's talk about the coming one, right? And I've already alluded to the fact that there might have been other people besides Jesus who thought, oh, you know, yeah, uh, I, as one of John's disciples, it might have been me. One interesting figure who is associated with John the Baptist 
that I want to at least briefly mention, but then set aside so I can come back to the coming one, you know, more generally. John is supposed to have had a, a, a disciple named Dositheus, who then becomes the teacher of Simon Magus, who, according to the Book of Acts and later Christian tradition, is supposedly the person who originates Gnosticism, right? And so there's something interesting there, right, that comes about. Uh, and how much of, you know, that, you know, how much does John influence Gnosticism is a question that I'm going to be wrestling with in there. Very interesting thing is that the Mandaeans in, you know, some, there's a Syriac source that refers to them and calls them Dostheans, which sounds like it might be a garbled form of Dosithian. And so is that because they know this tradition that there's a connection between John, Dosithius, and Gnosticism? Or is that a term that was used, right? Because Mandaean is not a term that is generally used by this group for themselves, right? It's a, it's a term that has come to denote the whole religion, but actually tended to denote lay people over against priests, right? Who are intriguingly enough sometimes referred to as Nazareans. And how that term gets into the Mandaean tradition is, is another interesting question that we just don't have time for. Uh, well, we have time for whatever you, you have time for and I have time for, but probably shouldn't go there. So the coming one, right? Basically, John is saying someone's coming, right? It's, it's this ominous, someone's coming, get ready, right? Someone's coming, he's going to be, you, you think I'm shaking things up? He's going to shake things up even more. I mean, he's going to be, you know, I'm, I'm telling you how to get ready, but he's going to start putting things in order, this kind of stuff. And is this a, a celestial figure or a terrestrial figure? Is it a combination of the two. John seems to be connected with a, a, a mysticism where a person experiences a sort of a union with a celestial figure. Is that, you know, part of this tradition? And if so, how does that play into things? Anyone, you know, how would you say, you know, someone is coming, right? There's, there's somebody, right? There's, there's one, there's somebody in Aramaic. Anybody have any ideas just from things you may have read or come across? How do you refer to one person, like non-specific? Like what's one of the phrases that's used? You may have come across this. Just like human being, you know. Son of man. Son of man. Yeah. Right. That's that's the expression. And Jesus, right? I wonder, that's another place where I wonder whether Jesus is continuing John's way of speaking about, you know, you know when, when, when someone comes and does this in this, you know, when this figure comes, it's, you know, it's this elusive way of speaking. And that would help us understand both how Christians could say, yeah, no, no, really, he's talking about himself, right? But also how John's followers might have been able to do the same things with the same kinds of sayings, right? Someone's coming, it's like, he, it's him, he just can't, you know, he can't say that just yet, but he will, right? Or something like that. And so there's some intriguing possibilities there, right? That you know, maybe some of the son of man tradition actually reflects at, at the very least John's influence and maybe the kinds of things that John actually said. And so there's, there's something there that I think is worth exploring further. And that's another thing that I'm looking forward to digging into. I, I definitely hope that you do. And uh, specifically, I hope that you are able to kind of take into account how like the son of man tradition, right? Uh, we, in, in the class last week, we were talking about how uh, it's, it's interesting that, you know, when Daniel uses it, you know, the phrase is not a title. When the parables use it of Enoch, they also are not using it as a title, which demonstrates that it had not become a title. Uh, it was not a popularly known thing. So the parables presumably is doing something original in what they're doing. It's trying to capture something. Um, but then, right, then the third individual we know that's using it in a similar light is Jesus. So that creates a very unique trajectory from Daniel's parables, Jesus, right? If you add John the Baptist in there, I think what makes that particularly interesting is again, it's especially it's difficult to know when the parables was written, right? It's it's difficult to to figure out is it contemporary with the time of Jesus, is it just before? So it could have been spread, right? It's hard to know. 
Uh, but if you bring John the Baptist into that equation, uh, which I don't think I've ever heard of anyone trying to do that. So I definitely am interested in, <laughs> in your trajectory there. But it definitely raises interesting questions regarding what we were discussing as a class as a whole is the possibility of these traditions in the parables actually having um, more of an effect than simply later in the 80s with the Gospel of Matthew. But the question of whether or not these traditions could potentially shed any light on the earliest Christian followers, uh, if not the historical Jesus himself, uh, just because, I mean, uh, not to derail the conversation too much, but uh, for me personally, my interest in the parables is, you know, I think it's remarkable that there is, in my reading of it, very little Enoch actually in the parables. If you remove the introduction, if you remove the two epilogue chapters, and you remove the, the, the Book of Noah fragments, and you remove the part that looks like a narrative transition in the midst of the beginning of the book, nothing in the book leads you to assume that this is necessarily um, Enoch speaking, Enoch in context, and the book's material is so unusual for the Enochic tradition to begin with, that you know it, it gives me the suspicion that is this reappropriated material? Is this potentially something that has been adopted into the Enochic tradition um, that is not necessarily has its origin there? And if it doesn't necessarily have its origin there, then again, that has really interesting implications for where did it have its origin, who would have been affected by this, who may or may not have necessarily been with either the Essenes or with that kind of literature. Um, and I just think that ultimately when you're dealing with the Son of Man figure, um, one of the, the things that I had alluded to before was the passage in Enoch where uh, I think it's, what is it, chapter 49, was there? No, 47, where you have, like I said, the righteous one um, who is one of the names for the chosen one, the figure who's coming. And this individual is, you know, if you read chapter 47 as describing um, a Messiah-like figure, uh, it, the implication is this figure is going to, in some sense, potentially suffer have like in, in a sense the way we read it is if we don't read it the Vanderkam Nicholsburg way the majority way it's almost like it paints the messiah figure as sharing the lot of all the martyrs like okay all the righteous are have their blood shed so too the righteous one and this is the decisive vin, you know the way that the chapter rolls the moment the blood is brought up to the heavenly court there's judgment and then like literally a, a, two chapters later it says in those same days um, the resurrection will occur, all the righteous are resurrected. And then, and then it's interesting, it says the Messiah, I mean, not the Messiah, the chosen one arises. And you could read that as the chosen one arises just like because he rises up or he like literally arises out of the grave with the righteous martyrs that he was a part of and now is vindicated. But again, like what's interesting is since you know, whether or not that is the correct way to read it. And obviously there are some scholars who do, um, they're a minority obviously, but whether or not that is, the material and the imagery and the language there is there to be read in that potential way. Someone could interpret those images in that fashion. And what influence that could have, not on the majority Judaism, but on potentially, um, you know, individuals. It, for instance, if you're a Jew living in the Second Temple period with Jesus, and you believe that the Messiah is going to be earthly, then you, I would assume, presume that he's going to die. You know, and if he's going to die, you presume he shares, you know, if this, if this person believes in a Messiah figure and an apocalyptic day of judgment, they probably believe in a resurrection at this period. So then they probably assume that that Messiah earthly figure who dies of whatever natural human causes is also going to be resurrected. If, if not him, who else could possibly be resurrected um, on that day of judgment as well. So a lot, I feel like a lot of the things that we assume are per se Christian ideas of uh, suffering or dying Messiah 
plus resurrection in a very generic way are, are kind of almost common sense ideas that for certain people they would have had whether or not they were expecting these things. And I think it's obvious from the gospels that if a passage like First Enoch you know, 47 could be read that way, it was not being read that way, right? Because I mean, like Peter's response towards Jesus and the gospels along with just like overall the evidence we have shows that I think generally this is not a portrait of a kind of view people were expecting, but whether or not it's the majority view, I mean, it's potential, right? And I feel like the parables along with other traditions, if we're looking at John the Baptist and we're looking at, I think it's great that you mentioned, the other figures of that time period who believed and fashioned themselves as the coming one and did some very strange things in regards to how they uh, expected to provoke the decisive moment to occur. If we're looking at this diversity, you know, of these, we could say fringe movements that are happening all around, um, maybe we shouldn't be looking for the majority view. Maybe the majority view would not be representative of them. And instead we should be looking for something more of an outlier. I don't know what you think of all that. Yes, so let me uh, say, let me say something that uh, connects the Enoch seminar thing that I'm talking about. The Enoch seminar doesn't just focus on Enoch, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, it did start by focusing on the Enochic literature, but it really is a, an organization that has worked to bring the study of early Christianity within the framework and within the context of the study of early Judaism. And so looking at Christianity as one of the many forms of Judaism in that time period. And so within that framework, really what I'm doing with the Mandaeans and Gnosticism and the question of Gnostic origins uh, is something that at the very least intersects with John, right? So there are Jewish, and then I would, I would want to broaden it out and say Israelite traditions that persist in places. Um, and they range from the, um, almost like what's being promoted in Jerusalem by you know, priesthood and official figures and things like that to things that are very different, but equally older, older in some cases. So not including the parables of Enoch, right? The ones that focus on the son of man figure, uh, that, but the, the rest of first Enoch, right? Includes some like geographical and other types of references that have led scholars to think they know where it might come from, and that's Upper Galilee, which I think is fascinating, right? Um, Jesus is connected with Lower Galilee, uh, but one question that I didn't really ask until I started working on, you know, some stuff at the intersection of Mandaeans, Gnosticism, John the Baptist, Jesus, is, you know, how on earth does Galilee come to be thought of as Jewish, right? I mean, I can, you can completely understand how it gets thought of as Israelite, right? That's a location where the northern tribes historically lived. But why Jew Jewish is connected with Judea, right? And you have Judea, and then you have Samaria. So why isn't Galilee Samaria? Why isn't it northern Israel? Why isn't it something, you know? And the history behind that is, of course, that the, uh, the Hasmoneans, right? The royal family that uh, takes the throne and the high priesthood um, in a way that is criticized by some who say, yeah, this is not in accordance with the Torah either. But uh, they make an effort to essentially, you know, ensure their control in the region of Galilee by uh, encouraging people to settle there from Judea. And so I think Galilee is a perfect place to have a confluence of some broader Israelite traditions of a variety of sorts, as well as you know, what's developing into you know, the mainstream of Judaism as centered in Judea, Jerusalem, temple, things like that. And I think that John being active in the Jordan River Valley, apparently in maybe in Transjordan, may have been intersecting more with some of those broader elements. And I think that those broader elements also find their way into the origins of Gnosticism. 
And so I think that there is at least some, sh there's some intersection that may be useful. And it may be that the reason why what I think was an esoteric tradition within the context of synagogues, within the context of Judaism, emerges from the shadows as Gnosticism, perhaps through some impetus from John's popularization and the widespread acceptance of an approach to religiosity that is is Jewish or Israelite, but is not focused on the Jerusalem temple, is not focused on getting forgiveness there. And so is not entirely on board with the Torah focused approach as understood by what, um, what some will promote as the mainstream and or as orthodoxy. And of course there's no orthodoxy in this period. But there are some things that are much further afield. And there are some elements which we won't get into today that I don't, because I don't think they influence John necessarily, but in Mandayan literature, there are names of light world figures that seem to reflect pre-exilic Israelite tradition and things like that, that are just, you know, it's like, how do those things persist into there? And I think around the edges of the extent of where Israelites were to be found, the promotion of monotheism, of Torah, of other things didn't catch on always to the same extent. And so that's maybe the most radical fringe of that broader tradition. John is somewhere closer to the center, but he's not, he doesn't reflect the view of the, the main authorities. And that would lead to a natural segue to return to the thing that I asked to be reminded of before baptism. we get too far, baptism, John's baptism. Uh, you mentioned in one of the New Testament texts, and we want to make sure we keep coming back to those New Testament texts, right? That in John's gospel, the Jewish authorities are depicted as asking him, you know, why do you baptize if you're not, you know, Elijah, you're not the prophet, you're not the Messiah. I found myself asking, you know, it's, it's not an obvious thing. Why would those figures particularly be expected to baptize? Um, you know, what's the connection? There doesn't seem to be one. If, though, there is a, a connection with sacrifice, and what John is doing is basically offering a different form of sacrifice or an alternative to sacrifice, then maybe there is, because, you know, Elijah builds an altar, which is, you know, it's like, wait a minute, is he supposed to do that? Isn't, isn't worship supposed to be focused in Jerusalem and the temple by the stage? Oh, well, you know, and prophets can do that. The prophet like Moses maybe can do that. Uh, the centering of the worship in Jerusalem, you know, is connected with the Davidic king, right? Building the temple there. Um, you know, and the, the house of God apparently relocates from Shiloh to Jerusalem and things like that. And so the figures mentioned might actually have a connection around altar building and sacrifice and things like that. Except that John is offering, as it were, a temple not made by human hands um, and a mode of forgiveness that doesn't cost anything. And so possibly ties in with his focus on social and economic justice there. Uh, the poor can afford to be immersed, right? Even if they can't afford a lamb or even a couple of turtle doves very easily. And so one of the things that bringing Mandayan sources into the picture lets us see is that there are other ways of understanding baptism than the ones that we naturally think of when we're coming to John through a Christian lens. For Christians, baptism is a once for all, um, you know, for Paul, incorporation into the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, it's being, you know, how you become in Christ and things like that. Maybe it's mystical union with him. Uh, maybe it's a second exodus motif. We can get into some of those questions if you like. But it's a one-time thing. If John's baptism is an alternative to or substitute for sacrifice, then it would be natural to do it often. And the pseudo-Clementine literature, which also mentions an on ongoing followers of John who think he's the Messiah rather than Jesus, refer to John as being part of a movement known as the Hamero-Baptists or the Daily Baptists, Daily Immersers. And that, I think, brings us back to the very name of John and the designation by which he's known, namely John the Baptist. One way that I think we sometimes take that instinctively is as denoting this person who has this unique thing that he does and no one else, and so he's known for that. But 
another natural way of understanding it is that he's John, you know, not the American Baptist or the Southern Baptist, you know, not Baptist in that sense, but John, who is this famous proponent, this famous exemplar of this wider immersing movement. And he's the one that maybe, maybe he consolidates it, maybe he's a leader in it, but he's not either the originator or the only one. And so that's intriguing, but we can actually see Mandaean baptisms. And you know, maybe the thing to do now is just to uh, share the screen and show you that uh, if Matthew will allow me to do share screen, then, or I can actually just put the, the video into a link or something as well. Um, let's see, yep, there we go. So. And don't worry about the sound, but just want you to see this practice, right? So you can actually observe Mandaean baptism and it, you know, they dress in white for this. They don't normally dress like that. Uh, a priest has to be present in order to do this. And you know, you're immersing yourself in the water, although you don't go all the way in. Uh, there are interesting things that are done with, you know, uh, the water and then sprigs of myrtle and all kinds of symbolism that's involved in the process. But this is something that's done regularly and then there are also major festivals and it's essentially preparation for going to the light world, right? going to the world above, um, getting past the purgatories and the malevolent forces and being able to ascend after one's death. Uh, they also drink some of the water. Um, that you know, there, There's some interesting things that are quite unique to them. But even if one doesn't think that there's a historical connection between John and the Mandaeans, just the way their practice raises this possibility, right? This interesting possibility that we ought to consider anyway, that maybe this is a repeated act. That would not only explain better John's baptism being a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, it would also help us understand why as soon as Christianity makes baptism a once for all thing, immediately, pretty much, you have these debates going on about, well, what happens with post-baptismal sin, right? It's like, didn't anyone think of that sooner, right? Why is the church debating this? Why is the church worried about this? If it emerges out of John the Baptist's practice, which is repeated, and suddenly you're not repeating it anymore, right? And it's interesting that Hebrews mentions baptisms in the plural at one point, which is also an intriguing motif. And so I think there, there's also something very interesting and worth thinking about. So you can find this on YouTube, and if you can't find it easily, I will happily share it with you. Um, there's no particular reason to uh, keep this going rather than looking at one another. But I think that we should think about the question of, you know, what did John's baptism actually mean for people, right? And the possibility that it was an alternative to sacrifice and it was connected with messaging about, you know, the temple essentially being done away with would connect John with some things Jesus is supposed to have said, some things that the Christian sources find embarrassing and then some things that become quite central to at least some of Jesus's followers, right? So that, for instance, Stephen, you know, is accused of, predicting that, you know, Jesus is going to change, change what Moses ordained and is also going to, you know, mess with the temple and these kinds of things are going to happen. Having mentioned what Moses ordained, let me mention one other thing uh, because I realize we're just about out of time and then the rest of our time will be talking about anything that you want to talk about without me, hopefully, um, going off on too many tangents or just rambling on about stuff I find interesting that isn't what you asked about. I shouldn't be promising that because I'm not very good at it, but I'll do my best. But one thing I do want to mention as an example of a reason why I think there is historical material that is useful for scholars of John the Baptist in Mandaean sources. One is just the following logic of comparison, which is that if all we had about Jesus was a brief mention by Josephus and then the stuff they found at Nag Hammadi, which were the Gnostic texts, historians would be all over them and saying, you know, well, we think this might distort Jesus because our earliest source and Josephus doesn't give us this impression, but we, you know, we bet there's some stuff in here that we can use. 
And because we have the New Testament Gospels, we actually know that that's the case, right? There are plenty of sayings that are in the canonical Gospels that also show up there, right? And so if the Mandaean sources are like that, then we should use them and see, is there anything here that we can find? Uh, linguistic study, right? what we did when um, Charles Heberl and I worked on the Mandaean Book of John. The Book of John is a composite work, and so some of it reflects later forms of spoken Mandaic, right? very late forms of the language, and some are much closer to Syriac, as it's known from the Peshitta, the um, Syriac you know, translation of the New Testament. And so there is evidence that there's a compilation of things, that things are being written down in various phases. But most importantly, connecting with that theme of what Moses ordained and Jesus possibly tampering with it. In the baptismal story in the Mandaean book of John, John accuses Jesus of loosing the Sabbath, <clears throat> which Moses ordained. And that's very interesting for two reasons. One is that exact kind of phrase in Greek, but nonetheless that exact kind of phrase is used in the Gospel of John, right? Jesus is accused of loosing the Sabbath, right? In other words, tinkering with it, right? Undoing it, loosening it, uh, and maybe threatening it in the process. The other thing that makes me think this is historical reminiscence in Mandaean sources is that the Mandaeans don't like the Torah that Moses ordained. They are Gnostics who view the Torah as the work of the creator who is responsible for this material world that they view negatively. And so this is a negative figure. And that creator, who's in, is, is fascinating, I mean, he's called Adonai, right? And rides in a celestial chariot, right? Like, just like in Merkava mysticism and in Ezekiel and things like that. There's all this, these fascinating connections. But this is not a positive figure, as in all Gnostic traditions. So why is John accusing Jesus of loosening the Sabbath that Moses ordained? It's not something that would be a complaint from a Mandaean perspective. But if they're drawing on some tradition or some sources, written or oral, that go back to before they had this full-fledged Gnostic perspective, then that might make sense. Right? And so there, there's something interesting there that deserves to be pursued. And of course, the whole question of John's relation to the law and Jesus' relation to the, the law and how they compare and contrast with one another, whether the same or different, whether they are positive, negative, or picking and choosing, as just to let you know a little secret, everybody does. But uh, some do it better, and some do it more consistently, and some do it with a rationale, and others even try to pretend they're not doing it at all. That's a whole other comparison. You know, how much, if we, we need to puzzle out, and I'm going to try and puzzle out as much as I can, but we need to know a lot more about John's view of the law in order to speak about that. But I think that as I explore further in this book project, John's baptism and how it relates to sacrifice, his ethical teaching and how it relates to Torah, uh, other, other things that John might be interacting with and drawing on, uh, some of that will hopefully come into clearer focus. And just to return to one thing mentioned earlier before I kind of wrap up what I want to say, uh, looking at how the book of Revelation figures into it will also be part of that, I promise. Professor McGrath, I... I um... Before I, I bring up a point you made in the chat uh, regarding um, the who told Jesus from, and I, I'd love for us to, to delve more. I know like a lot of people here have questions specifically about the chapters we read within the, the Mendayan book of John. Uh, but one question I'd have is like in, in summary, as we're wrapping up the, the first, the two hours, um, what do you think or what would you be willing to say at now, at this point, tentatively, is uh, your portrait of what you think could be historically reconstructed about who John was? Obviously, you're still going to do a lot of research into it and, and go quite further into it. But right now, at this moment in time, would you be willing to give like your own description uh, in summary of what you think can be historically said about this figure? Yeah, uh, so there, there's there's a lot there that I'm, you know, one reason why I'm planning on writing a book rather than just turning out an article is that I think there's there's a lot of detail. On the other hand, I think there's a there's a crucial, you know, there's a crucial um, need for 
want to be able to summarize and give it as bullet points and not elaborate on every single detail. You know? And I think that I think that we can say a few things about John, and all of these will require further elaboration, but I won't go there because we don't have the time and also because some of it's not fully developed. I think John is a figure who talks about one who is to come, right? And that there's there's someone else coming, and so he's not the end of the process of of reform, of revolution, of reformation, of transformation. I think that he he challenges the idea that simply being part of a people is all that's needed, regardless of how you live. And so I think ethics is central, and that at least some of that focuses on you know, social and economic justice. What are people doing with money and things like that? Uh, I think his baptism does seem to have been one that brings not just purification from external impurity, but forgiveness of sins. I think there are probably enough strands there for us to be able to say that there's probably a, an element of mystical experience in this. Um, I think all of us have had either a really great cold shower or a really great hot bath that uh, just did wonders for us at some point. But you know, in a world in which flowing water is not everywhere, uh, having this experience, you know, doing something sacred that involves immersion in running water, what in Aramaic is called living water. That's another phrase that's common between you know, the New Testament and Mandaean sources. Uh, certainly would be conducive to having religious experiences, but between the gospel's portraits of Jesus having what we might call a religious experience there, and then uh, Mandaism having a mystical element to it, uh, there being you know, a mystical element there in Gnosticism that also, you know, and, the Sethian tradition, as known from Egyptian you know, sources, also seems to have baptism as part of their um, thing. Another thing that I didn't get into, but which I think might have something to it, is you know, is it a form of what we might call you know, doppelganger mysticism, right? Where you are connecting with, associating with some sort of celestial figure, right? So people are asking, is John Elijah, right? In Mandaean and other Gnostic sources, you often have heavenly counterparts of earthly figures, right? And in the Enochic tradition, while it, it may not be there from the very beginning of the development of the Son of Man tradition, at least fairly early in redaction of first Enoch as well as in other sources, you have this tradition that actually that's Enoch himself who sees this figure and then basically becomes that figure, becomes identified with that figure, right? And the possibility that that might also be part of the meaning of Jesus talk about son of man as a figure that it's a celestial figure, that's a future figure, but there's a possibility of identification with himself. Uh, I think Dale Allison actually does something interesting with that, you know, the possibility that this is essentially a celestial doppelganger who is, is going to be embodied in, or is maybe already starting to be embodied in Jesus. Um, is there a connection between this and, you know, who do people say that I am, right? Maybe you're John the Baptist. How could he be John the Baptist, right? What would that even mean? One of the other prophets, you know, what is that, you know? And so there, there are some interesting connections there uh, that I think could be grouped under the heading of mysticism, right, of some sort. And it may be possible to connect John with that broader tradition of Jewish mysticism um, and of mysticism more generally. Uh, beyond that, um, I don't know that John said he was the Messiah, although the question of what kind of Messiah one is talking about, you know, is a crucial part of it, right? Because, you know, there are all kinds of anointings, and certainly being an anointed one is interesting, was one reason why John's right was thought to be effective, the fact that he supposedly is from a priestly line, right? I mean, there's certainly a tradition of that. There, there are some interesting, you know, is that one reason why Jesus baptizing activity, you know, there's debate about whether Jesus actually baptized and who baptized, but then also about his baptism. Um, I think given the criterion of embarrassment, there's probably some truth to John having expressed 
you know, some doubt about whether Jesus is the coming one, you know, in that message he sends from prison, right? And then one of the things I'll need to spend some time looking at is the question of the death of John, because Josephus in the New Testament agree that you know, he's executed. Uh, the Mandaeans don't have that tradition, right? He basically uh, encounters this child at the Jordan River who actually turns out to basically be, you know, an, a manifestation of divinity who sort of takes him by the hand to be baptized. And then basically John sort of sinks into the Jordan and becomes kind of becomes one with it and goes off, the spirit goes off. And so there's this whole other tradition there. And so there, there are some historical questions about the beginning and end that I'll need to, to puzzle out. But I think if I can say some of those things and maybe you can get into some of the details of his ethical teaching and figure out through focus on these things, a little bit more about how he viewed the law and whether he viewed the law. I don't think he, he, I mean, he doesn't seem to reject the law, but he doesn't seem to simply say, do what the commandments say, right? And so Jesus might actually be a bit more conservative than John in that regard. Uh, Jesus can say, well, not all the commandments really express God's perfect purpose. You know, Moses could give something for the, because the hardness of his heart because of the hardness of your hearts rather. But, you know, he could also say, you know, follow the commandments um, and maybe get them interestingly wrong at one point because, you know, there's that Mark inversion where it's like, do not defraud, uh, which sounds a lot like John, right? So which commandments are these exactly, you know, and which, you know. So there are all kinds of interesting questions there that need further exploration. But I think the, the possibility of, um, a more robust picture than we've tended to paint so far is possible. And I'm looking forward to fleshing out some of those details. That was fantastic. You, you blew my mind. Um, by the way, you, if you can make me host again, that, that'd be good. Okay. Um, but uh, you blew my mind with uh, Dale Allison. Sorry, I was just kidding. I, I just muted you there for a second just to Oh, <laughs> you, you did threaten to do that before. I see you. I see you went ahead and uh, you followed through. You're uh, the host now. I was just teasing. Sorry. Um, I, I do that even with groups that which, you know, where it's like, I don't know the rest of this group well enough that I ought to be doing that sort of thing. Be I, like, can see why I can't believe you. he muted Matthew. What kind of guy is this? Why did he invite him? I can see why students love you so much. His students, they love him. Like that was, that was obvious at the end of the semester. Um, but then they get their work back and so, you know. <laughs> that was like they were just doing it in order to hope that you would give them good grades in return but <laughs> didn't work on you um so one of the things that's really interesting that i don't think we've ever covered in this class actually up to this point but for some would be very interesting and ties in with what dr mcgrath has said is how uh, there's a common perception of a singular messiah because of the fact that we are used to hearing the son of man traditions in the New Testament from Jesus. Um, oh, I didn't mention also earlier, but it played a role that like, even though Jesus is said to say the son of man traditions all the time, none of the disciples do, the New Testament authors don't, Paul doesn't really fall into it, right? Like, so son of man is a very unique concept, which is for those interested, which is part of the reason why we looked at the parables, because it is just a unique tradition. And along with that, I think what's interesting is, right, um, what Dr. McGrath was alluding to in regards to whether or not John thought of himself as a Messiah figure is the fact that the Jews actually were in the Second Temple period largely expecting two Messiahs, a priestly and a sort of royal Messiah. And these two were going to function in the popular imagination independently, but coordinatedly. And they were going to each have their own respective role. Um, and what kind of is, is fascinating, one could think, and I was thinking, is that John only alludes to the one coming. Mm -hmm. He's not alluding to two. And Jesus, when he speaks, carries that kind of tradition of the Son of Man coming, not uh, a dual partnership. And 
you know, what I felt like, and correct me if I'm wrong, when Dr. McGrath was pointing out about whether or not John the Baptist thought of himself as a Messiah figure, I think Dr. McGrath was thinking to that dual two-person group because being a priestly Messiah, right, John the Baptist is said, according to the Gospel of Luke, to come from, uh, be descended from a priest. And so there is, in some sense, that connection of priesthood with John the Baptist doing these, you know, strange activities that would prompt one to think, are you the priestly Messiah? But then it's, I do think it's curious, and I'd be curious what you think, Dr. McGrath, about why it seems both Jesus and John the Baptist Maybe that's not curious that they'd agree if they're disciple and, and student, but um, why John the Baptist is already to a certain degree on the fringe for having a view of a singular Messiah, which curiously enough agrees with the parables where there is only a chosen one, the righteous one. There is not a, a dual party. We don't have that going on necessarily. We have just this central pre-existent heavenly like figure there who's going to be a messiah but is going to be involved on the earth to some degree um it's just curious that you know this is not the mainstream correct me if i'm wrong this doesn't seem to be the mainstream viewpoint um but then again if i was going to come up with a counter argument for that before you do the disciples don't seem to expect that there's going to be two messiahs either like they they don't seem to reference that view either, so I, I don't know what to do so, with that. But well, how is this for an idea that this is prompting? Uh, is it possible that John might have thought that he is the priestly Messiah who's preparing the way for the royal Messiah? Certainly, I think it could be possible. Right. Although sure according they, to the traditions, he denied being the Messiah. Yeah, is he denying being one or both of them? Is he? basically saying that you know, you don't need a you know i'm the priestly maybe. figure but my my role is to undo <laughs> the priesthood and it's uh it's maybe. power structure and things like that he doesn't so, do the priesthood he he goes he uh, if, if the tradition's right about his father he doesn't pursue the priesthood he goes out into the wilderness and then he starts doing the thing that the priests are doing in the temple out in the wilderness um you know it, it does it could look like if not, I'm the priestly Messiah, I'm functioning in a priestly role on behalf of the Messiah. So maybe indeed that is connected to the tradition. Yeah, I don't know that anyone's ever tried configuring them in precisely that way. Um, actually, I think, I feel like somebody has, but I'm just, it's not coming to me. Uh, but it's certainly worth exploring in terms of, you know, are they, you know, priest and king figures? In, you know, not necessarily John and Jesus working together, thinking in those terms already, but John, when he's talking about one who is to come after me, is that more like the, you know, the figure from the parables who's going to rule, whereas he is the one who's focused on the, you know, the means of atonement and other things. You know, there's, there's certainly something there. And does exploring. that, and I'd be curious too, does that play a role? The, the gospel tradition is that John the Baptist got in trouble for what he said about a marriage. But if he's, if he was, and this is a big if, if he was in a priestly preparation role for a royal messiah, that's a royal messiah, right? So that would be a royal, you know, claim to Herod's claim, right? That would be an opposition, a potential threat. And the gospels are also very clear that Herod was exceptionally, you know, we know this historically, Herod was exceptionally uh, paranoid about his royal throne. Um, so that might provide a fascinating alternative explanation for why John the Baptist ends up dying. If that was what he was doing, that would seem to provide even more rationale actually for like why Herod might have taken him out because it's like, oh, he's like literally playing the role of getting my successor. I'm not gonna let that happen. Since he, he killed his own kids. So, you know, I doubt the Baptist was, you know, of much more consequence given those dynamics. But I don't know if you think that that's a, a worthy thought. Yeah, the Herods, you know, the, the whole family. So, you know, I mean, you know, Herod the Great, you know, is paranoid beyond belief in killing his kids. And then, you know, the, 
you get the tetrarchy and the you know split with the different regions, and so you get Herod, you know, Antipas, you know, is who's the main one that you know John and Jesus are interacting with. And the gospels say it was you know criticism of the marriage, and of course, criticizing a king's marriage is you know criticizing a king and you know his legitimacy and you know legitimacy of you know offspring and of you know dynasty and things like that. And there's you know there's there's some there's some stuff there that one can connect without much effort to you know question of who's who's going to be on the throne in the future and things of that sort. There's also an interesting connection between you know what you asked and you know about the uh, the death of Herod and something I mentioned earlier, which is the possibility that Jesus' action in the temple is while he's still part of John's movement. I've been struck as I've thought about this that you know, Josephus's statement about why John is executed by Herod is that you know, he saw that he you know had these people sort of flocking to him. You know, was gathering people. There was support for him, and he saw that. You know, his followers were ready to do anything for him, right? And might there have been, you know, an incident in the temple that, you know, basically it was like, you know, is that what he's thinking of? Is you know. So there are all these possible points of intersection between the traditions, you know, when you start digging, when you start digging around John, instead of just digging around Jesus and like ignoring, you know, unless John seems to be telling you something directly about Jesus, then it's like, you know, we'll put him over there in the corner and we'll get back to him if, you know, he says something else about Jesus, but... Sometimes when you start actually focusing on the figures that you have been neglecting, um, and this is also true in my work on women with you know, whom Jesus intersected, there you start actually noticing things about that figure that was where you started your interest possibly, that you never ever would have noticed if you didn't start filling in the picture more, not just by focusing on that person, but by looking at who else they, they relate to. Definitely. Um, I think like, uh, I know certainly some people here have really interesting questions about um, the, the chapters they saw in the, the Mandayan book. Mm -hmm. But um, if we could kickstart that uh, in regards to a question that Amanda had raised, um, and that is that in regards to the reference uh, to Elizabeth and a star falling, um, what are what what could you shed light on in regards to um, potentially the Mandayan view overall of what stars might symbolize or mean, what you think that this might mean in relationship to Elizabeth, anything you could share in regards to that? Yeah, it's, it's natural to think about the star, you know, coming over Elizabeth and you know, the star in Matthew's gospel, right? There's also a tradition, and this is one of those questions about Mandayan sources, you know, John sources, Jesus sources, and which one's influencing the other. But there's some tradition about John the Baptist sort of fleeing into the wilderness, right, being taken there for safety as a child, you know, and things like that. And so there, there are these interesting questions about, you know, nativity and stuff like that. Uh, his relationship to Zechariah is an al also an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, you know, Zechariah, like, Elizabeth is with John and is on John's side, and Zechariah, you know, I think was already annoyed with John, and then it's like, you know, it's like, I'm divorcing her and stuff. But it's like, there's all kinds of family drama and stuff around John. That's fascinating. But coming back to the star, you know, so, I mean, in general, you know, the, the, there is some room for just talking about sun, moon, and stars in their sort of mundane sense, the same way we would. But the 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 seven planets, right? So the as they think of them, so the the sun, moon, and the five visible planets, and then the signs of the zodiac representing the stars, are all the malevolent figures that are you know dominating this material world. That one is looking as a Gnostic, whether Mandayan or Sethian or otherwise, to escape from out under the influence of, right? And so it's interesting that, you know, the star there seems to be a, a positive sign. So again, is that an indication that it's, you know, there's something subversive being done with that tradition, or is that a sign that the idea of a star appearing is is older, but and, it, you know, older than they're taking a sort of negative view of stars and things like that? 
But I think the, the whole notion of heavenly portents, right? Heavenly signs indicating that something important is going to happen and some important figure is going to be born is, is wide, so widespread that it doesn't even require a direct influence. And I, I, I suspect that even Gnostics could use it without thinking, oh yeah, well, we don't actually like stars. So maybe that's not the best symbol of that. It's like just such a widespread, you know, star or comet, something appears and it's like a ruler is going to be born, a world leader or a figure, you know, something like that's going to happen. One thing that's interesting is that as that story unfolds, the priests predict that it's, it's bad news for the temple and for Torah, you know, that John is appearing with his baptism. And one of the things that it does, that I think is another one of those examples of, you know, really something comical that the tradition does, is that it says there's a groaning from the, the chariot. Like, so the celestial chariot that Adonai, who is also the sun, uh, rides across the sky. And, you know, the chariot is, of course, the focus in uh, Merkava mysticism, right? So that's the, the word means chariot, right? That's where it comes from. And that's what Ezekiel focuses on. That's where that image comes from in Judaism, right? It's the celestial throne chariot. And so the, the Jewish God, the creator God, rides one of those in the Mandaean sources. And John is going to shake things up on earth and in the heavens to such an extent that you know, there's groaning coming from there. And is that, is that like God is groaning or is that the chariot's about to lose its wheel? You know, and it's going to fall off its axle. It's, it's, it's hard to know exactly what the imagery means, but it's, you know, it's fascinating, both in how it intersects with Jewish and Christian tradition, but also how it kind of uses those things to polemicize against them. Uh, but yeah, but it, it even goes on to say that, you know, John is, is taken from the, essentially from the, the light world, you know, or sort of from the, the source of the Jordan and is, is planted in the womb of Elizabeth. And so it's almost incarnational, even though John is not thought of as like, you know, a celestial being incarnate, really. And so there's, there, there's some interesting intersections there as well with the, you know, Christian ideas about Jesus' birth. Does that does that answer your question from Sunday, Amanda? I, I would say, you know, it adds a different, um, I don't know, more uh, complications, I suppose, to it too. I'm just, <laughs> but it's it's neat, you know, it's fascinating. It doesn't seem like there's necessarily one set. This is the way it 100% is, but there's a lot of room for, um, you know, interpretation or, or hypothesis. So. Yeah, and so I mean, I think the, the one other thing that might be w worth saying, I, and I, it's this is a lot of the, the what you're asking about is, you know, the, it's hard to answer because it's so, there's so much that we're uncertain of. Um, and hi to whoever's appearing there. But uh, yeah, um, I think there's definitely some comparison and contrasting going on both on the side of the Mandaeans and on the side of the Christians between John and Jesus. And the thing that we may never be able to say for sure, but I'm going to be digging into it in a lot more detail and promise to again get back to you if I have any really exciting insights, is can we figure out when one is borrowing from the other, right? So does the star start with John's followers and then get end up in Matthew's gospel or does it start in Matthew's gospel and then get picked up by some of John's followers or, you know? And those are the kinds of questions that need to be asked right there. Although I think that the Magnificat, you know, Sir Mary's song, probably in the Gospel of Luke is supposed to be Mary's words and not Elizabeth's. But there is actually, there's actually some manuscript evidence for, you know, scribes having written Elizabeth there. And so I'm going to at least, you know, raise the question, if John is drawing on a source from circles of followers of John about John's nativity and John's parents and things like that? Is he also borrowing a song but applying it to Jesus? It doesn't work as Elizabeth's song in the current context, but could it have in a source that Luke is drawing on? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not persuaded of that as of this point. You know, I haven't seen evidence pointing to that. But when you get a manuscript, you know, of the Gospel of Luke that actually attributes that to Elizabeth. Is that because of you know some interference from a source, or is that just a, a scribal error, or is that you know? So there are all kinds of questions that 
a comparison between the sources raise that we it's really you know we we know they're interacting we don't know who's you know we don't know who fired the first shot you know <laughs> basically so uh, does anybody else have any questions about the the reading in the Mandayan literature that you saw? We only saw two chapters. There's obviously a lot more in the the book, and you should get a, a hold of the book. Um, I know that uh, uh, it's expensive as heck, and I know that uh, Professor McGrath. I think you, it's open source, right? The translation. Yeah. So the translation, yeah, and the the raw text in the original language. Not that that'll necessarily interest you all that much. But the raw translation is available in open access form. Again, if you just Google Mandayan Book of John open access, you should find it. Um, we have it on academia.edu, right? So you should be able to get it there. If you can't find it, then just you know, find my email address. Um, again, I can put that in the chat. So you have it if you, if you need it. And I will happily send you the link to that. And then I would, but I would say, you know, I would recommend asking, some library that is local to you that maybe has a budget for expensive volumes like that to get it because uh, not just because we like when it sells, but most importantly, because there is a commentary in that that really digs into the question of, okay, so where, where are the Mandaeans influenced by Judaism and where might, where is the conversation moving in the other direction? What's the relationship between the traditions and things of that sort? Thank you, Amanda. Uh, enjoyed your company. So uh, Shannon has a question in relationship to, oh, and I see you put your, your email in the chat. That's good. Um, Shannon, what's your question for Dr. Uh, I posted my question in the chat. Um, is there, I mean, you're, you've got the, the, Professor McGrath's got the translation of the Mandean John. But is there a translation for all the other scriptures of uh, the Mandian, Mandian scripture? So their main sacred text uh, is known as the Great Treasure, the Ginza right. Rabbah. And that one has not been translated in English in its entirety as of this point, which is frustrating. Yeah, and I keep seeing pieces of it, but I don't see, the, I, I don't see anywhere I can get the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I think somebody, you know, there, there are some people who've done some things, you know, that look like they may have taken the, like, German translation by Lidzbarski and have run it through Google Translate and stuff like that, and then self-published the result. Uh, so there are, there are some things out there. And there, I think there may even be somebody who actually worked through and properly translated Lidzbarski's German, which, you know, is still progress. Uh, but, yeah, what, what we did was to actually go back to the, the sources. And one of the things we were able to do was to actually take photos, make digital images of uh, scrolls. Uh, well, in our case, we're dealing with a text, uh, codex, not scrolls. But uh, we also did some photographing of some other things. Because uh, some of those scrolls are really interesting. And I want to show some pictures of those if there's interest. But the uh, we were able to incorporate some some manuscripts that belong to Mandayan priests without having to either purchase them or get them to sell them to a library or get them to make a handwritten copy or something like that, which was how you used to have to do it. So we were able to not only do a translation from the original uh, um, language, but also to incorporate a wider textual base for that translation. And so uh, it was a really exciting project to be involved in. But uh, you can find a number of the Mandayan texts that have been translated in English. Um, so some of them were translated by um, uh, Ethel Stefana Drauer, who is a pioneer in this field. Uh, she was the wife of a British um, ambassador or British diplomat to um, Iraq uh, decades and decades ago. And she got to know this community and basically you know, just took an interest and she acquired for the Bodleian Library in Oxford, the biggest collection of Mandayan sources. Keep in mind, everyone, that this is a Gnostic tradition, right? So this is a sort of esoteric tradition where you don't normally share these things with everyone. And so that was like fairly controversial what she did there, but it also has meant that there has been study of these things. And so a lot of the things that she translated into English are available and some of them you can actually find online. Um, some of them actually, it's fine that they're online. Some of them are there and maybe shouldn't be, but uh, don't necessarily, you know, 
you can probably find them before anybody pulls them down because nobody seems to be hunting them down. How do you spell her name? So it's Drower, D-R-O-W-E-R. -E okay, and thank you. Yeah, sure. And one of the things that's, you know, so scholars studying the Mandaeans has actually been sometimes beneficial to, uh, sometimes controversial in, but also sometimes beneficial to the Mandaean community. And one of the things that was really humbling to me, but also uh, encouraging to continue, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to record this, is that so uh, on my first ever visit to Australia, uh, not that long ago, I had the opportunity to meet with the really, really enormous Mandaean community there, um, not, not with all of them, but with representatives of it. And I met people who had, you know, reached out to me before, when they heard that I'd be going there to say, you know, well, if you're coming, let's meet and things like that, uh, who are Mandaeans, who are Mandaeans, and who told me that they essentially had found my blog, had found YouTube videos I'd put online and things like that about their tradition, when they, uh, not having really learned a lot about what they believe and what their tradition is, went looking for more information. And so, they were actually getting information from me and I really was hoping I'd be getting information from them. And so it was incredibly humbling, right? As somebody who feels like, you know, there's this wealth of literature there and this, you know, rich tradition that I've only really begun to familiarize myself with. And there's so much more that I still have to learn to find that others were looking to me for authoritative answers about their tradition was, um, yeah, worrying, I need to be honest, but also, you know, very humbling, but also is one of the reasons why I want to, when I'm talking about these subjects that intersect with their tradition, to make those things available because uh, they actually themselves find them interesting. And as they find them interesting, also share their perspective, which enriches the things that people are interested in Jesus and Christianity or Judaism. Um, well, I think it's a fascinating area of study, if for no other reason, because of its ancient roots. Yeah, so let me show you, just because we're talking about Mandaean texts and which ones have been translated or which ones are available. Well, let me see if Matthew, um, I promise I'll never mute him again, ever, um, <laughs> metaphorically or literally. Uh, are you Zoom sure? But if are I can share. Absolute, that's a promise. That's a promise. Um, or are you just gonna be tricky like John and suddenly quote Isaiah or something to undo me? Who knows, really, right? But yeah, if you can um, allow me to screen share. Oh, I'm the host now. Let's see. I should be able to screen share. So let me take you, uh, maybe first and foremost, to um, Facebook. Of course, we can never escape it. Right. But uh, yeah, if, if, if you find me on Facebook, I, do sh I did share some pictures. But this is a Mandayan family. They've actually been responsible for putting together some facsimile editions of some of their texts. But in addition to things that are in book form, there are scrolls. And some of those scrolls are illustrated, right, with depictions of you know, the light world, depictions of the afterlife and things like that. And some of these scrolls are just, just so fascinating and so interesting and so beautiful, right? The detail on them is amazing, right? I mean, you need not just textualists, but art historians to look at them, right? Uh, you have this idea, you know, you have the wow. light world depicted in terms of rivers, right? And so there are ships in the light world and light world beings and things. And the artwork is incredibly distinctive, right? And so obviously I wanted lots of pictures holding these uh, texts because you know, they're, they're simply fascinating, I think, right? There you have this scroll that's about rivers and trees, and so there's all these different kinds of trees that are depicted. And oh my. the illustrations on them are just fascinating in and of themselves, and are you know part of the meaning of these these texts. And so, and given all the problems in that part of the world, the idea that vir virtually all of this could have been lost is just striking. Yeah, and so one thing I've said often about the Mandaeans is that if somebody were to find these texts, dig them out of the ground for the first time today. And it's like, wow, these are a dialect of Aramaic and they're a Gnostic group we didn't know about before. 
and they mention John the Baptist and they like him and they mention Jesus and they don't like him so much. Oh my God, you know, this would be all over the news. This would yeah. be, you know, people would be rushing to translate these things. It'd be project, it would probably take as long as it took them with the Dead Sea Scrolls, admittedly, but you know, there'd be, there'd be extensive work. And I think it's the fact that in response to the uncritical use of Mandaean sources by New Testament scholars, there was a backlash, you know, and people like New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd uh, said, you know, well, maybe the Mandaeans borrowed John the Baptist in order to get in with Islamic authorities and say, we have a prophet, you know, and here's our prophet. And since they're a baptizing group, well, we'll pick a Baptist, you know, and, and that just doesn't work in terms of the chronology and the development of the tradition and uh, the configuration of the tradition, what we know about it. And so one of the reasons for my project about John the Baptist, bringing the Mandaean sources into the picture, is to hopefully get more people to do what I think is going to be the only thing that anyone's going to do with these sources in the short term, which is work on these things as second interests alongside a main field, which is something else, right? So as I started New Testament and came to uh, the study of the, the Mandaean texts and those kinds of things. Uh, that's what almost everybody who works in this field of Mandaean studies does, right? Euron Buckley is the exception where that was her main thing and she dabbled in other things from time to time. But pretty much nobody hires anyone to work specifically on this. And it's actually a product of being at an institution where, because it's primarily undergraduate, you know, it's not a research one institution where, you know, I'm like the gospels guy. And if I even branch out into Paul, I'm stepping on someone else's toes. It's like, it's religion? Sure. Research it. Why not? You know, go ahead, whatever. It grabs your interest. And so I've had a remarkable freedom to pursue some of these things that uh, you might be surprised to learn that not everyone could if they were going with conventional PhD route and conventional uh, research-oriented institutional um, academic career path. And so hopefully if I can persuade people that use critically, these sources are worth looking at if you're interested in Second Temple Judaism, if you're interested in the origins of Gnosticism, uh, even if you work mostly in the Coptic sources, if you're interested in Jesus, these sources are worth looking at for the ideas well, think, they plan. I think your idea of them being interesting, even from a, I, I studied at a research one institution, a couple of them actually, and mm -hmm. I did study in some art history while I was there. And I think that if you get, if you presented this material to some art history and historians, they'd be very interested in going out and, and throwing some graduate students at this kind of thing, because it, you, just like you said, even without the, the biblical area of it, it's, it's fascinating, you know, archeo archeologically and art history wise. Yeah. I mean, you and show an that's <laughs> Yeah. And there is one art historian at um, La Trobe University, um, I wanna say, if I'm remembering correctly, um, in Australia, um, who works, works on these things, um, uh, Sandra Va, uh, Van Rompe. Um, and so there is, there is somebody um, who is doing some work and who hopefully will publish. Um, I know she's had a book she's been working on. Uh, so, but there's, there's room for more and there's a need for more. And this is the sort of thing which, if you're mainly interested in something else, bringing this in by way of comparison, both enriches this field of study and does something potentially meaningful in relation to this, but also gives you a new way of doing something in relation to that other area that might be well trod, right? So one, one thing that has kept me coming back to this over and over and over again is that New Testament, it's like, can I say something even slightly new about these texts that have been studied for, you know, more than a millennium and you know, for centuries, even in the modern academic sense. And then you go to an academic conference. And the first time I went to a conference about the Mandaeans, uh, they're very rare, but they do happen occasionally. But first time I went to one, I was like, am I gonna be accepted as this person coming through New Testament and trying to offer something in conversation with Mandaeans? And pretty much on the one hand, that was the story of everyone there. They work on other things as well, and maybe primarily. And then also, every single paper 
at that conference. It was like, here's a dozen things that it would be great if somebody somewhere would work on them. And so there's, there's lots of room. And so for instance, uh, somebody asked, I saw in the, um, the chat about angelology and uh, demonology. And so there's, there's plenty of room to do work on that, right? Uh, a text that Drower translate is known as, you know, it's like one of their magical texts. Um, I think it's called it the Mandaean Book of Black Magic. Uh, as in Judaism and Christianity, Mandaean authorities tend to frown on magic, and yet there was a vibrant tradition around the edges. And there's a direct intersection with Jewish um, apotropaic magic um, used to protect against demons in the form of magical bowls or incantation bowls of the sort that they found. Um, and I can find you a, a picture online, I'm pretty sure, of one of those. Um, yeah, I read about that. I don't remember which book, but yeah. <laughs> and so uh, there are Mandaic ones and Jewish ones that are directly, you know, copied from one another, or which use the same text but have different types of figures mentioned. And so the Mandaeans have some very distinctive names in their tradition of celestial figures. Uh, there are also interesting points of intersection and overlap sometimes. And there's some borrowing between the two. And so one of the questions I have, right, so Mandaic as an, a, a language is a form of Aramaic, very similar um, to other forms spoken in Mesopotamia, uh, not quite the same as the um, Aramaic of the Talmud, which is a little bit different, mostly probably because it's from a different part of Mesopotamia. But one question I have is, is this a community that spoke one language but used two different alphabets? Or are these two communities that have a sense of being genuinely separate, right? Because we have no secular usage of the Mandaic, the Mandaic script. It's only used in sacred texts and in incantation bowls. And so was this initially a community that, or a group that was thought to have more powerful magic and had some esoteric texts and was doing this thing within a Jewish context, within an Aramaic speaking context, right? Yeah, so there you can see the font that was actually developed for, uh, one of the fonts that was developed for the book that we were working on for the edition. So one of the things we had to do was to actually develop a font because there wasn't a, a font that we could simply use to represent this language. And if you read older texts, um, older editions of things, they either uh, used Hebrew or Aramaic letters, or they transliterated things into English, right, with some diacritical marks, or, right, Lidzbarski, right, that's why this font is named after Lidzbarski. What Lidzbarski did, and it's pretty impressive, but it's also very time consuming, was he actually copied it by hand when he made his German edition. So the, Man, the Mandayan text is actually his writing, right? And so the alphabet is, is quite distinctive in a lot of ways. And so there's, there's a whole tr fascinating tradition here with lots and lots of elements to it. And so, Semitic philologists, right? People who are interested mainly in the Talmud, but want to have a wider linguistic source to draw on and trying to make sense of obscure words and things like that, will turn their attention to the Mandaeans. People who are interested in Judaism and Islam, people who are interested in refugees from the Middle East, um, will turn their attention to the Mandaeans as a contemporary living tradition. And th there's room for lots of people to do this. And so whatever, if you're going into any kind of academic field where you could do research, um, there's, there's room to, to dabble. This is uh, something I've gotten into later in life. Um, I'm actually come up for the last 40 years or so as a experimental quantum physicist. <laughs> wow. Uh, working in the semiconductor industry. So, um, uh, this is uh, the overlap between um, 
how far you can go in quantum physics before you start becoming a metaphysicist, uh -huh. we're at right out there on the edge. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So that's a feel that, that that interests me too, but we'll, we'll save that for another time as well, or future yeah. conversation. So yeah, it's this. It's surprising when I run into an area like this that has just seems to be bereft of study. And uh, because as you mentioned, you know, so much of this has been studied for almost millennia now. Yeah, um, I think bringing the Mandaeans into the picture will help, help us get some new perspective on some of those things that have been studied for a really long time, as well as hopefully being interesting just in terms of what it says about the Mandaean. Uh, Professor McGrath. Yeah. Um, it, uh, Joseph wanted to ask whether um, he, he read, uh, I think he was saying that on the bowls he could see uh, Liliac re referenced and he wondered if that was Lilith the night demon and if that played a prominent role in Mandean literature or incantations. So is that, I think so, Liliac is, is, it, um, is a character in the book of John, right? Was that where you came across that? Joseph says yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You got you got him muted. I take it, or he's got himself muted, or he's got himself. Just wants to, yeah. Prefers to text, which is fine. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Anyway. Yeah. So I'm here. Uh, yeah. I did. I did read that. It was like in the first yeah. parts where where the the text actually is, and I just kind of was scanning for different phrases, and I saw that, um, and it just kept repeating something. I did not die in the night, or something like that. Um, and, and as far as I know, Lilith, Lilith is like a night demon. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know if Liliac is Lilith. No, and, and I'd say no. I mean, Liliac seems to be a, an interpreter of dreams, you know, in that story. Like they go to him, it's like he's got the book of dreams and he knows how to interpret dreams and he can, he can say what this star over Elizabeth means and, you know, or the, you know, saw three points of light. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. Like a um, contrast which, of light and dark. Sort yeah. Of gotcha. Um, yeah. I, it's interesting that the Mandaeans have both the the emanationist standard Gnostic kind of thing, but also do some more dualistic things, which is interesting being in, you know, essentially in not just Mesopotamia, but also being found in Iran and Persia, uh, seem to be interacting with that, where there's a light world, but they're like these dark waters. And of course, they, you know, exist in southern Mesopotamia, where you actually have, you know, oil fields and things. So they may have actually seen some, like, dark waters, <laughs> whatever they would have called them, that were just, you know, um, became part of the mythology. Um, but Liliac, you know, it's a, a very unusual name. It's one of those names, there are a number of names in the Mandaean tradition where it's like, where did they come up with that? And who is that? It's a pretty sure in the Mandaean incantation bowls, right? Because that's a major concern, you know, in the magical tradition is protection against these, you know, protection against Adam's first wife. You know. um, and that but they're a little later, right? Their tradition goes a little late, like in the 6, 12, 1600. So like maybe some of the motifs from really old may not be, it may be a later development, right? Obviously later development then. So there's, there's some things that we, it's really hard to say how old they are. And I actually have shared a video, so I won't get, I won't get into it now. I'll just say, hey, go watch this and then uh, but I'll happily talk more about it once you do, but may as well just direct you to that. So I shared a video of the presentation I'm giving for the Enoch seminar. But essentially there are some names that appear in Mandaean sources that I think you can only explain if they're drawing on either some really ancient Israelite traditions, like from before the exile. Right? There are light world figures with names like uh, Yorba, which seems to come from Yah the Great, right? Yah Rubba, you know, Yoshimim, which is Yah of Heaven, right? And a lot of these, Yak Yokobar, right? Yah, you know, again, Yah the Great, but using Kabar, right? Right? Similar to Arabic Akbar, right? This is the you know, greater, you know, fam familiar to many people. Uh, you know, Hebrew and Aramaic have the have a cognate, but we know of you know the name Baal Kabar. And you know Baal Shemayim, right? And you know, so it's interesting that you have names that are formulated with Yah, right, which is the distinctive sort of Israelite God, but then also these things that are more like you know the ancient Israelite polytheistic expressions of that, right? Yeah. 
And then there seems to, you know, Anat seems to be part of that as well. And there's a figure who's called Tahil, which seems to be a reference to, you know, again, Ta, you know, the, the Egyptian deity, who is identified with El in Canaan, right, during eras of Egyptian rule, things like that. So there's, there's some really intriguing stuff in the Mandayan tradition that, you know, I'm going to be exploring a, a really new idea in that paper, but I've, I've made a recording of the short version of it online, uh, mostly because I want to be able to spend most of our time discussing in that meeting rather than me doing lots of talking, that maybe that prote a protest against the imposition of monotheism might actually lead to a formulation of a, a negative view of the creator and the idea that the creator is the only God and the supreme God, which you get in Gnosticism, and that that might reemerge in Gnosticism, right? In, the Gnostic literature as we come to know it in later times. But yeah, there's a lot of shared interest in a lot of the same figures in terms of demons and in terms of also the, some of the same practices in order to deal with them. Thank you. I had one more quick, uh, if we had time. Um, yeah, we can go with one more question before I have my own and then we'll probably close it out. Okay, so I'm good? Okay. Yeah, 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 go, cool. All right. Um, so uh, when I was when I was in Israel, I was up in like the Samaria area, which is uh, more north than where the traditional John the Baptist site was. But um, like Samaritanism, like, you know, having that different worship spot outside of Jerusalem. I'm just thinking like um, disconnecting from the temple and disconnecting from, you know, what's going on with the Pharisees and everything like that. Um, was there ever sort of like a like in apoc apocalypticism, was there ever like a notion of an already not yet sort of thing where that it's going to be destroyed, but we're going to rebuild or the Messiah is going to rebuild it one day. Like we have it spiritually now, but it's going to be literal in another time. Yeah. So the, the Mandaeans, like other Gnostics are really much more focused on getting out of this world. Uh, they don't have the negative, like, so they're not opposed to, um, marriage, sex, procreation, those kinds of things, which some Gnostics were, but, you know, that's not always present. Um, but ultimately, you want to get out of this world to another, right? And so this world, in its materiality, is, the, you know, was a mistake, right? And that world beyond uh, didn't desire for this mistake to happen, but since it did, it, you know, there's this expression of compassion, and you get this outreach from the light world to uh, provide a means and provide revelation in order to lead people and show them the way there. And, you know, John kind of plays a role, just like some celestial figures do, in getting people connected with the light world uh, through his baptism, through his teaching. Mm -hmm. And so it is much more of an otherworldly focus type of religion rather than, a, you know, something's going to appear in this world, there'll be a resurrection of the body or that sort of thing. A materialist. Yeah. 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 Thank Shares you that view of matter is, you know, essentially negative. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. So my question to wrap this up, and now we're at the, the almost the end of the third hour. Um, my question is, because the course that this lecture is taking part in is is the early Jesus traditions, and we're trying, we've we've already spent a long time thinking through the criteria and the history of historical Jesus scholarship, and we've taken a detour through the parables of Enoch, and now we're we're looking at the origin uh, to a degree we're we're intersecting with the origin of Jesus's ministry with John the Baptist, his potential teacher, at least that's the way that the Gospel of Mark certainly wants to present it. Um, the question then I'd have for you, Dr. McGrath, is how sh does, um, or I should rephrase this, how for you in working on your book and your project going forward, what are your thoughts about the value and the contribution that the historical John the Baptist, the study of that, has for people uh, thinking about how we study the historical Jesus? Are there, is there any insights in how we study John that lead us to perhaps revise or seek new ways or reinforce what we've been doing uh, in good ways methodologically or otherwise 
for the historical Jesus? What's the value that you see? Yeah. Uh, so I think the value is, you know, first and foremost, that when we understand, you know, to the extent that we can understand somebody's uh, mentor, um, whether we conclude that was positive influence, negative influence, a bit of both, um, you know, largely embraced the mentor's message and continued it or took things in a, a completely new direction or partly new direction, uh, we still get a better understanding of what that meant by contextualizing it there, right? If we had, you know, to the extent that we can get a sense of a historical Socrates, uh, it helps us make sense of you know, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, we have to work through those kinds of figures and Xenophon and you know whatever and get you know sort of dig backwards. But you know that circularity is there throughout, right? It's it's basically the same thing that we're asking when we say, how does this Christian literature that's doing something with Jesus that we are not sure was precisely what Jesus said and did in relation to himself, and saying how much of that actually comes from him. And so I think that by looking at those questions, one thing that might happen, right? Um, I started off studying the Bible in an academic context as, you know, coming out of a, a fairly conservative you know, religious viewpoint and approach. Uh, when you study some of this academic stuff, and even if you just are, approach the Bible honestly, that may get challenged um, as you work on that. But, you know, my... I've tried, you know, being as skeptical as possible. And, you know, Matthew and I have had conversations about things like mythicism, where it's like, yeah, it's all made up. And it's not, it's like, yeah, no, some of the, in, some of the data, you know, some of the evidence actually resists, you know, push, you, you try and explain it in a way that somebody just made this up. It's like, yeah, it just doesn't seem like something somebody would make up, right? You know, and you can force yourself, you know, you can force it all into that framework, but it doesn't. And so I suspect that we're going to find there's more of John and Jesus. And in the process, I find that there's more of Jesus than some historians have been willing to see in some of the theological interpretation of him in the New Testament, right? where the, the two are intertwined. We won't be able to separate it out. They're taking it further, maybe, than Jesus ever did, but they're drawing on him. And we need to have a both and sort of answer and maybe say we can't get him into sharper focus than this we're seeing him through somebody's lens but we're seeing him right we're catching a glimpse and so i think both as a contrast but also as a as a, a point of comparison even on the methodological level there's there's something there and i think that as john perhaps through you know bringing other sources into the picture raises questions about you know what was his view of the law or what broader Israelite traditions was he interacting with and drawing on, then raises some of those same questions about Jesus, right? It, it wasn't until I was working on, you know, questions about John um, and, of, you know, also being interested in the historical Jesus that some of those questions about what kinds of things might have persisted in Galilee, right, that were outside of the mainstream uh, really started to become a, a question worth asking. And then if Jesus does have, um, you know, and this connects with my, what Jesus learned from women book, which because of the time we will not say about anything else about right now, but I will happily talk more about uh, individually for anyone who's interested. But Mary, according to a local tradition there, is supposed to, her parents are supposed to have been from Sepphoris, which is this big city, right, um, about six kilometers from Nazareth. Joseph is supposed to be of the line of David, and so maybe he's one of those recent arrivals. You know, maybe not he himself, but his parents, his grandparents from Judea, right? Um, during that Hasmonean effort. And maybe Jesus and his emphasis on gathering the 12 tribes reflects a vision that brings Davidic messianism and that broader Israelite tradition together, right? And maybe John is part of that effort as well, right? Uh, some of the ways that John speaks might might actually suggest that Jesus got that in his upbringing, but, you know, maybe John shared that. Uh, I think it's an interesting question as well, whether John, even though he's active in the Jordan Valley, I mean, is he connected with the Galilee as well? And that in itself is, I think, an interesting question. So I think there are lots of ways that 
working on John enriches the picture of Jesus, whether you know both directly and indirectly, both by way of contrast and by way of continuity and in terms of substance and in terms of methodology. Thank you. That's a great answer. And uh, I, I, I think I speak for everyone who's left already, uh, anyone who's watching this video uh, uploaded wherever it is. And um, for the students who have stuck with this uh, up until now, uh, the, the oh, how, how should we refer to them? There's three of them. So we could say this is the, the inner circle of Jesus, right? The, tr the truly elect ones, John, James, and uh, Peter. <laughs> on the mountain transfiguration <laughs> i might be i might be putting you up on that mountain there um <laughs> but uh the uh thing is i think i speak for all of us when i say thank you so much for taking the time and opportunity to speak and to share your wisdom and knowledge which is endless um and uh honestly uh Thank you for giving me the chance to have a break and uh, actually get to to learn something uh, and uh, be surprised by uh, really a fantastic translation uh, and project that you've offered. I mean, not only is it interesting, but it's like genuinely something that's truly contributing to the field and to a wide range of studies. And it's wonderful that you've been involved in it. And uh, it's a powerful project. So I'm just really happy both that you've done the project, that it's a resource now for people, as well as uh, that you talk about it, share with it, and uh, that you came on here to be able to discuss with us what you've done. It's, it, it's been a wonderful three hours, truly. I have thoroughly enjoyed them as well. So thank you so much for having me. Um, as you can tell, I enjoy talking about these things and find them interesting. Um, it's better than talking just with myself about them, right? Um, so uh, the conversation has actually really benefited me. Um, as you've asked questions and as you've uh, pointed things out that you found interesting, it's, it enriches m my work or just sometimes just encourages me to keep talking about these things. Like, I'm not the only one who finds this interesting. Hooray! <laughs> we I'm all alone with it, but I actually got some valuable things out of this. And if you're interested, you know, stay in touch and you know, via the blog or elsewhere and you know, they'll, they'll be, I'll be continuing to work on these things. And, yeah, and, and everybody should follow uh, Dr. McGrath. Like, and he doesn't just do Mandian, Mandian stuff. Like, I mean, you do everything. Uh, <laughs> there's not like, there's not nothing under the sun that you're not in some sense touching on or involving with your blog or with your posts or, I mean, like your news commentary even is fantastic. <laughs> so um, yeah, Dr. McGrath's just somebody to be connected with in general. Uh, thank yeah, you thank again. You, thank you, Dr. McGrath. You've got my brain turning, definitely. <laughs>